The 33 Strategies of War Written by Robert Greene Preface We live in a culture that promotes democratic values of being fair to one and all, the importance of fitting into a group, and knowing how to cooperate with other people. We are taught early on in life that those who are outwardly combative and aggressive pay a social price, unpopularity, and isolation. These values of harmony and cooperation are perpetuated in subtle and not-so-subtle ways through books on how to be successful in life, through the pleasant, peaceful exteriors that those who have gotten ahead in the world present to the public, through notions of correctness that saturate the public space. The problem for us is that we are trained and prepared for peace, and we are not at all prepared for what confronts us in the real world. War. This war exists on several levels. Most obviously, we have our rivals on the other side. The world has become increasingly competitive and nasty. In politics, business, even the arts, we face opponents who will do almost anything to gain an edge. More troubling and complex, however, are the battles we face with those who are supposedly on our side. There are those who outwardly play the team game, who act very friendly and agreeable, but who sabotage us behind the scenes, use the group to promote their own agenda. Others, more difficult to spot, play subtle games of passive aggression, offering help that never comes, instilling guilt as a secret weapon. On the surface, everything seems peaceful enough, but just below it, it is every man and woman for him or herself. This dynamic infecting even families and relationships. The culture may deny this reality and promote a gentler picture, but we know it and feel it in our battle scars. It is not that we and our colleagues are ignoble creatures who fail to live up to ideals of peace and selflessness, but that we cannot help the way we are. We have aggressive impulses that are impossible to ignore or repress. In the past, individuals could expect a group, the state, an extended family, a company, to take care of them. But this is no longer the case, and in this uncaring world, we have to think first and foremost of ourselves and our interests. What we need are not impossible and inhuman ideals of peace and cooperation to live up to, and the confusion that brings us, but rather practical knowledge on how to deal with conflict and the daily battles we face. And this knowledge is not about how to be more forceful in getting what we want, or defending ourselves, but rather how to be more rational and strategic when it comes to conflict, channeling our aggressive impulses instead of denying or repressing them. If there is an ideal to aim for, it should be that of the strategic warrior, the man or woman who manages difficult situations and people through deft and intelligent maneuver. Our successes and failures in life can be traced to how well or how badly we deal with the inevitable conflicts that confront us in society. The common ways that people deal with them, trying to avoid all conflict, getting emotional and lashing out, turning sly and manipulative, are all counterproductive in the long run, because they are not under conscious and rational control, and often make the situation worse. Strategic warriors operate much differently. They think ahead toward their long-term goals, decide which fights to avoid and which are inevitable, know how to control and channel their emotions. When forced to fight, they do so with indirection and subtle maneuver, making their manipulations hard to trace. In this way, they can maintain the peaceful exterior so cherished in these political times. This ideal of fighting rationally comes to us from organized warfare, where the art of strategy was invented and refined. In the beginning, war was not at all strategic. Battles between tribes were fought in a brutal manner, a kind of ritual of violence in which individuals could display their heroism. But as tribes expanded and evolved into states, it became all too apparent that war had too many hidden costs, that waging it blindly often led to exhaustion and self-destruction, even for the victor. Somehow, Wars had to be fought more rationally. The word strategy comes from the ancient Greek word strategos, meaning literally 
the leader of the army. Strategy in this sense was the art of generalship, of commanding the entire war effort, deciding what formations to deploy, what terrain to fight on, what maneuvers to use to gain an edge. And as this knowledge progressed, military leaders discovered that the more they thought and planned ahead, the more possibilities they had for success. Novel strategies could allow them to defeat much larger armies, as Alexander the Great did in his victories over the Persians. In facing savvy opponents who were also using strategy, there developed an upward pressure. To gain an advantage, a general had to be even more strategic, more indirect and clever than the other side. Over time, the arts of generalship became steadily more sophisticated as more strategies were invented. Although the word strategy itself is Greek in origin, the concept appears in all cultures, in all periods. Solid principles on how to deal with the inevitable accidents of war, how to craft the ultimate plan, how to best organize the army, all of this can be found in war manuals from ancient China to modern Europe. As a whole, these principles and strategies indicate a kind of universal military wisdom, a set of adaptable patterns that can increase the chances for victory. Perhaps the greatest strategist of them all was Sun Tzu, author of the ancient Chinese classic, The Art of War. In his book, written probably in the 4th century BC, can be found traces of almost all the strategic patterns and principles later developed over the course of centuries. But what connects them, in fact, what constitutes the art of war itself in Sun Tzu's eyes, is the ideal of winning without bloodshed, by playing on the psychological weaknesses of the opponent, by maneuvering him into precarious positions, by inducing feelings of frustration and confusion, a strategist can get the other side to break down mentally before surrendering physically. In this way, victory can be had at a much lower cost. And the state that wins wars with few lives lost and resources squandered is the state that can thrive over greater periods of time. Certainly, most wars are not waged so rationally, but those campaigns in history stand out above the rest and serve as the ideal. War is not some separate realm divorced from the rest of society. It is an eminently human arena, full of the best and the worst of our nature. War also reflects trends in society, the evolution toward more unconventional, dirtier strategies, guerrilla warfare, terrorism, mirrors a similar evolution in society where almost anything goes. The strategies that succeed in war, whether conventional or unconventional, are based on timeless psychology. The strategic ideal in war, being supremely rational and emotionally balanced, striving to win with minimum bloodshed and loss of resources, has infinite application and relevance to our daily battles. Inculcated with the values of our times, many will argue that organized war is inherently barbaric, a relic of man's violent past and something to be overcome for good. To promote the arts of warfare in a social setting, they will say, is to stand in the way of progress and to encourage conflict and dissension. Isn't there enough of that in the world? This argument is very seductive, but not at all reasonable. There will always be those in society and in the world at large who are more aggressive than we are, who find ways to get what they want by hook or by crook. We must be vigilant and must know how to defend ourselves against such types. Civilized values are not furthered if we are forced to surrender to those who are crafty and strong. In fact, being pacifists in the face of such wolves is the source of endless tragedy. Others will argue that war and strategy are primarily matters that concern men, particularly those who are aggressive or among the power elite. The study of war and strategy, they will say, is a masculine, elitist, and repressive pursuit, a way for power to perpetuate itself. Such an argument is dangerous nonsense. In the beginning, strategy indeed belonged to a select few, a general, his staff, the king, a handful of courtiers. Soldiers were not taught strategy, for that would not have helped them on the battlefield. Besides, it was unwise to arm one's soldiers with the kind of practical knowledge that could help them to organize a mutiny. 
or rebellion. To maintain strategy and the arts of war as a branch of specialized knowledge is actually to play into the hands of the elites and repressive powers who like to divide and conquer. If strategy is the art of getting results, of putting ideas into practice, then it should be spread far and wide, particularly among those who have been traditionally kept ignorant of it, including women. Instead of resisting the pull of strategy and the virtues of rational warfare or imagining that it is beneath you, it is far better to confront its necessity. Mastering the art will only make your life more peaceful and productive in the long run, for you will know how to play the game and win without violence. Ignoring it will lead to a life of endless confusion and defeat. The following are six fundamental ideals you should aim for in transforming yourself into a strategic warrior in daily life. Look at things as they are, not as your emotions color them. In strategy, you must see your emotional responses to events as a kind of disease that must be remedied. Fear will make you overestimate the enemy and act too defensively. Anger and impatience will draw you into rash actions that will cut off your options. Overconfidence, particularly as a result of success, will make you go too far. Love and affection will blind you to the treacherous maneuvers of those apparently on your side. Even the subtlest gradations of these emotions can color the way you look at events. The only remedy is to be aware that the pull of emotion is inevitable, to notice it when it is happening and to compensate for it. When you have success, be extra wary. When you are angry, take no action. When you are fearful, know you are going to exaggerate the dangers you face. War demands the utmost in realism, seeing things as they are. The more you can limit or compensate for your emotional responses, the closer you will come to this ideal. Judge people by their actions. The brilliance of warfare is that no amount of eloquence or talk can explain away a failure on the battlefield. A general has led his troops to defeat, lives have been wasted, and that is how history will judge him. You must strive to apply this ruthless standard in your daily life, judging people by the results of their actions, the deeds that can be seen and measured, the maneuvers they have used to gain power. What people say about themselves does not matter. People will say anything. Look at what they have done. Deeds do not lie. You must also apply this logic to yourself. In looking back at a defeat, you must identify the things you could have done differently. It is your own bad strategies, not the unfair opponent, that are to blame for your failures. You are responsible for the good and bad in your life. As a corollary to this, look at everything other people do as a strategic maneuver and attempt to gain victory. People who accuse you of being unfair, for example, who try to make you feel guilty, who talk about justice and morality, are trying to gain an advantage on the chessboard. Depend on your own arms. Everything in life can be taken away from you, and generally will be at some point. Your wealth vanishes. The latest gadgetry suddenly becomes passé. Your allies desert you. But if your mind is armed with the art of war, there is no power that can take that away. In the middle of a crisis, your mind will find its way to the right solution. Having superior strategies at your fingertips will give your maneuvers irresistible force. As Sun Tzu says, Being unconquerable lies with yourself. Worship Athena not Ares. In the mythology of ancient Greece, the cleverest immortal of them all was the goddess Metis. To prevent her from outwitting and destroying him, Zeus married her, then swallowed her whole, hoping to incorporate her wisdom in the process. But Metis was pregnant with Zeus's child, the goddess Athena, who was subsequently born from his forehead. As befitting her lineage, she was blessed with the craftiness of Metis and the warrior mentality of Zeus. She was deemed by the Greeks to be the goddess of strategic warfare, her favorite mortal and acolyte being the crafty Odysseus. Ares was the god of war in its direct and brutal form. The Greeks despised Ares and worshipped Athena, 
who always fought with the utmost intelligence and subtlety. Your interest in war is not the violence, the brutality, the waste of lives and resources, but the rationality and pragmatism it forces on us, and the ideal of winning without bloodshed. The Ares figures of the world are actually quite stupid and easily misled. Using the wisdom of Athena, your goal is to turn the violence and aggression of such types against them, making their brutality the cause of their downfall. Like Athena, you are always one step ahead, making your moves more indirect. Your goal is to blend philosophy and war, wisdom and battle, into an unbeatable blend. Elevate yourself above the battlefield. In war, strategy is the art of commanding the entire military operation. Tactics, on the other hand, is the skill of forming up the army for battle itself and dealing with the immediate needs of the battlefield. Most of us in life are tacticians, not strategists. We become so enmeshed in the conflicts we face that we can think only of how to get what we want in the battle we are currently facing. To think strategically is difficult and unnatural. You may imagine you are being strategic, but in all likelihood, you are merely being tactical. To have the power that only strategy can bring, you must be able to elevate yourself above the battlefield, to focus on your long-term objectives, to craft an entire campaign, to get out of the reactive mode that so many battles in life lock you into. Keeping your overall goals in mind, it becomes much easier to decide when to fight, and when to walk away. That makes the tactical decisions of daily life much simpler and more rational. Tactical people are heavy and stuck in the ground. Strategists are light on their feet and can see far and wide. Spiritualize your warfare. Every day you face battles. That is the reality for all creatures in their struggle to survive. But the greatest battle of all is with yourself your weaknesses, your emotions, your lack of resolution in seeing things through to the end. You must declare unceasing war on yourself. As a warrior in life, you welcome combat and conflict as ways to prove yourself, to better your skills, to gain courage, confidence, and experience. Instead of repressing your doubts and fears, you must face them down, do battle with them. You want more challenges, and you invite more war. You are forging the warrior's spirit, and only constant practice will lead you there. The 33 Strategies of War is a distillation of the timeless wisdom contained in the lessons and principles of warfare. The program is designed to arm you with practical knowledge that will give you endless options and advantages in dealing with the elusive warriors that attack you in daily battle. Each section of this program is a strategy aimed at solving a particular problem that you will often encounter. The strategies themselves are culled from the writings and practices of the greatest generals in history, as well as the greatest strategists. They range from the basic strategies of classical warfare to the dirty, unconventional strategies of modern times. The program is divided into five parts. Self-directed war how to prepare your mind and spirit for battle. Organizational war, how to structure and motivate your army. Defensive war, offensive war, and unconventional, dirty war. Each section is illustrated with historical examples, not only from warfare itself, but from politics, culture, sports, business, showing the intimate connection between the military and the social. These strategies can be applied to struggles of every scale, organized warfare, business battles, the politics of a group, even personal relationships. Finally, strategy is an art that requires not only a different way of thinking, but an entirely different approach to life itself. Too often there is a chasm between our ideas and knowledge on the one hand, and our actual experience on the other. We absorb trivia and information that takes up mental space but gets us nowhere. We read books that divert us but have little relevance to our daily lives. We have lofty ideas that we do not put into practice. We also have many rich experiences that we do not analyze enough, that do not inspire us with ideas whose lessons we ignore. 
Strategy requires a constant contact between the two realms. It is practical knowledge of the highest form. Events in life mean nothing if you do not reflect on them in a deep way, and ideas from books are pointless if they have no application to life as you live it. In strategy, all of life is a game that you are playing. This game is exciting, but also requires deep and serious attention. The stakes are so high. What you know must translate into action, and action must translate into knowledge. In this way, strategy becomes a lifelong challenge and the source of constant pleasure in surmounting difficulties and solving problems. Part 1. Self-Directed Warfare War, or any kind of conflict, is waged and won through strategy. Think of strategy as a series of lines and arrows aimed at a goal at getting you to a certain point in the world, at helping you to attack a problem in your path, at figuring out how to encircle and destroy your enemy. Before directing these arrows at your enemies, however, you must first direct them at yourself. Your mind is the starting point of all war and all strategy. A mind that is easily overwhelmed by emotions, that is rooted in the past instead of the present, that cannot see the world with clarity and urgency, will create strategies that will always miss the mark. To become a true strategist, you must take three steps. First, become aware of the weakness and illness that can take hold of the mind, warping its strategic powers. Second. Declare a kind of war on yourself to make yourself move forward. Third, wage ruthless and continual battle on the enemies within you by applying certain strategies. The following four sections are designed to make you aware of the disorders that are probably flourishing in your mind right now and to arm you with specific strategies for eliminating them. These sections are arrows to aim at yourself. Once you have absorbed them through thought and practice, they will serve as a self-corrective device in all your future battles, freeing the grand strategist within you. 1. Declare war on your enemies. The Polarity Strategy Life is endless battle and conflict, and you cannot fight effectively unless you can identify your enemies. People are subtle and evasive, disguising their intentions, pretending to be on your side. You need clarity. Learn to smoke out your enemies, to spot them by the signs and patterns that reveal hostility. Then, once you have them in your sights, inwardly declare war. As the opposite poles of a magnet create motion, your enemies, your opposites, can fill you with purpose and direction. As people who stand in your way, who represent what you loathe, people to react against, they are a source of energy. Do not be naive. With some enemies, there can be no compromise, no middle ground. The Inner Enemy In the spring of 401 BC, Xenophon, a thirty-year-old country gentleman who lived outside Athens, received an intriguing invitation. A friend was recruiting Greek soldiers to fight as mercenaries for Cyrus, brother of the Persian king Athaxerxes, and asked him to go along. The request was somewhat unusual. The Greeks and the Persians had long been bitter enemies. Some eighty years earlier, in fact, Persia had tried to conquer Greece. But the Greeks, renowned fighters, had begun to offer their services to the highest bidder, and within the Persian Empire there were rebellious cities that Cyrus wanted to punish. Greek mercenaries would be the perfect reinforcements in his large army. Xenophon was not a soldier. In fact, he had led a coddled life. He wanted adventure, though, and here he had a chance to meet the great Cyrus, learn war, see Persia. Perhaps, when it was all over, he would write a book. He would go not as a mercenary, he was too wealthy for that, but as a philosopher and historian. After consulting the oracle at Delphi, he accepted the invitation. Some ten thousand Greek soldiers joined Cyrus's punitive expedition. The mercenaries were a motley crew from all over Greece, there for the money and the adventure. 
They had a good time of it for a while, but a few months into the job, after leading them deep into Persia, Cyrus admitted his true purpose. He was marching on Babylon, mounting a civil war to unseat his brother and make himself king. Unhappy to be deceived, the Greeks argued and complained, but Cyrus offered them more money, and that quieted them. The armies of Cyrus and Artaxerxes met on the plains of Canaxa, not far from Babylon. Early in the battle, Cyrus was killed, putting a quick end to the war. Now the Greeks' position was suddenly precarious. Having fought on the wrong side of a civil war, they were far from home and surrounded by hostile Persians. They were soon told, however, that Artaxerxes had no quarrel with them. His only desire was that they leave Persia as quickly as possible. He even sent them an envoy, the Persian commander Tissaphernes, to provision them and escort them back to Greece. And so, guided by Tissaphernes and the Persian army, the mercenaries began the long trek home, some fifteen hundred miles. A few days into the march, the Greeks had new fears. Their supplies from the Persians were insufficient, and the route that Tissaphernes had chosen for them was problematic. Could they trust these Persians? They started to argue among themselves. The Greek commander Clearchus expressed his soldiers' concerns to Tissaphernes, who was sympathetic. Clearchus should bring his captains to a meeting at a neutral site. The Greeks would voice their grievances, and the two sides would come to an understanding. Clearchus agreed, and appeared the next day with his officers at the appointed time and place, where, however, a large contingent of Persians surrounded and arrested them. They were beheaded that same day. One man managed to escape and warn the Greeks of the Persian treachery. That evening the Greek camp was a desolate place. Some men considered flight, but with their leaders dead, they felt doomed. That night, Xenophon, who had stayed mostly on the sidelines during the expedition, had a dream. A lightning bolt from Zeus set fire to his father's house. He woke up in a sweat. It suddenly struck him. Death was staring the Greeks in the face, yet they lay around moaning, despairing, arguing. The problem was in their heads. Fighting for money, rather than for a purpose or cause, unable to distinguish between friend and foe, they had gotten lost. The barrier between them and home was not rivers or mountains or the Persian army, but their own muddled state of mind. Xenophon didn't want to die in this disgraceful way. He believed that if the Greeks concentrated on the enemies who wanted to kill them, they would become alert and creative. If they focused on the vile treachery of the Persians, they would grow angry, and their anger would motivate them. They had to stop being confused mercenaries and go back to being Greeks, the polar opposite of the faithless Persians. What they needed was clarity and direction. Xenophon decided to be Zeus's lightning bolt, waking the men up and illuminating their way. He called a meeting of all the surviving officers and stated his plan. We will declare war without parley on the Persians. No more thoughts of bargaining or debate. We will waste no more time on argument or accusation among ourselves. Every ounce of our energy will be spent on the Persians. We will be as inventive and inspired as our ancestors at Marathon, who fought off a vastly larger Persian army. We will burn our wagons, live off the land, move fast. We will not for one second lay down our arms or forget the dangers around us. It is us or them, life or death, good or evil. Should any man try to confuse us with clever talk or with vague ideas of appeasement, we will declare him too stupid and cowardly to be on our side, and we will drive him away. Let the Persians make us merciless. We must be consumed with one idea, getting home alive. The officers knew that Xenophon was right. The next day, a Persian officer came to see them, offering to act as an ambassador between them and Artaxerxes. Following Xenophon's counsel, he was quickly and rudely driven away. It was now war and nothing else. Roused to action, the Greeks elected leaders, Xenophon among them, and began the march home. Forced to depend on their wits, they quickly learned to adapt to the terrain, to avoid battle, to move at night. They successfully eluded the Persians. It took several years, 
but almost all of them returned to Greece alive. Interpretation Life is battle and struggle. You will constantly find yourself facing bad situations, destructive relationships, dangerous engagements. How you confront these difficulties will determine your fate. As Xenophon said, your obstacles are not rivers or mountains or other people. Your obstacle is yourself. If you feel lost and confused, if you lose your sense of direction, if you cannot tell the difference between friend and foe, you have only yourself to blame. Think of yourself as always about to go into battle. Everything depends on your frame of mind and on how you look at the world. A shift of perspective can transform you from a passive and confused mercenary into a motivated and creative fighter. Focus on an enemy. It can be someone who blocks your path or sabotages you, whether subtly or obviously. It can be someone who has hurt you or someone who has fought you unfairly. It can be a value or an idea that you loathe and that you see in an individual or group. It can be an abstraction, stupidity, smugness, vulgar materialism. Do not listen to people who say that the distinction between friend and enemy is primitive and passé. They are just disguising their fear of conflict behind a front of false warmth. They are trying to push you off course, to infect you with the vagueness that inflicts them. Once you feel clear and motivated, you will have space for true friendship and true compromise. Your enemy is the polar star that guides you. Given that direction, you can enter battle. Keys to Warfare We live in an era in which people are seldom directly hostile. The rules of engagement, social, political, military, have changed, and so must your notion of the enemy. An upfront enemy is rare now, and is actually a blessing. People hardly ever attack you openly anymore showing their intentions, their desire to destroy you. Instead, they are political and indirect. Although the world is more competitive than ever, outward aggression is discouraged, so people have learned to go underground, to attack unpredictably and craftily. Many use friendship as a way to mask aggressive desires. They come close to you to do more harm. A friend knows best how to hurt you or, without actually being friends, they offer assistance and alliance. They may seem supportive, but in the end they're advancing their own interests at your expense. Then there are those who master moral warfare, playing the victim, making you feel guilty for something unspecified you've done. The battlefield is full of these warriors, slippery, evasive, and clever. Understand. The word enemy from the Latin inimicus, not a friend, has been demonized and politicized. Your first task as a strategist is to widen your concept of the enemy, to include in that group those who are working against you, thwarting you, even in subtle ways. Sometimes indifference and neglect are better weapons than aggression, because you can't see the hostility they hide. Without getting paranoid, you need to realize that there are people who wish you ill and operate indirectly. Identify them, and you'll suddenly have room to maneuver. You can stand back and wait and see, or you can take action, whether aggressive or just evasive, to avoid the worst. You can even work to turn this enemy into a friend, but whatever you do, do not be the naive victim. Do not find yourself constantly retreating, reacting to your enemy's maneuvers. Arm yourself with prudence, and never completely lay down your arms, not even for friends. You can sit back and read the signs, or you can actively work to uncover your enemies. Beat the grass to startle the snakes, as the Chinese say. Often the best way to get people to reveal themselves is to provoke tension and argument. The Hollywood producer Harry Cohen, president of Universal Pictures, frequently used this strategy to ferret out the real positions of people in the studio who refused to show what side they were on. He would suddenly attack their work, or take an extreme position, even an offensive one, in an argument. His provoked directors and writers would drop their usual caution and show their real beliefs. Understand. People tend to be vague and slippery because it is safer than outwardly committing to something. 
If you are the boss, they will mimic your ideas. Their agreement is often pure courtiership. Get them emotional. People are usually more sincere when they argue. If you pick an argument with someone and he keeps on mimicking your ideas, you may be dealing with a chameleon, a particularly dangerous type. Beware of people who hide behind a facade of vague abstractions and impartiality. No one is impartial. A sharply worded question, an opinion designed to offend, will make them react and take sides. Sometimes it is better to take a less direct approach with your potential enemies, to be as subtle and conniving as they are. In 1519, Hernán Cortés arrived in Mexico with his band of adventurers. Among these five hundred men were some whose loyalty was dubious. Throughout the expedition, whenever any of Cortez's soldiers did something he saw as suspicious, he never got angry or accusatory. Instead, he pretended to go along with them, accepting and approving what they had done. Thinking Cortez weak, or thinking he was on their side, they would take another step. Now he had what he wanted, a clear sign to himself and others that they were traitors. Now he could isolate and destroy them. Adopt the method of Cortes. If friends or followers whom you suspect of ulterior motives suggest something subtly hostile, or against your interests, or simply odd, avoid the temptation to react, to say no, to get angry, or even to ask questions. Go along, or seem to turn a blind eye. Your enemies will soon go further, showing more of their hand. Now you have them in sight, and you can attack. An enemy is often large and hard to pinpoint, an organization or a person hidden behind some complicated network. What you want to do is take aim at one part of the group, a leader, a spokesman, a key member of the inner circle. Personalize the fight, eyeball to eyeball. Enemies bring many gifts. For one thing, they motivate you and focus your beliefs. The artist Salvador Dali found early on that there were many qualities he could not stand in people. Conformity, romanticism, piety. At every stage of his life, he found someone he thought embodied these anti-ideals, an enemy to vent on. First, it was the poet Federico Garcia Lorca, who wrote romantic poetry. Then, it was André Breton, the heavy-handed leader of the Surrealist movement. Having such enemies to rebel against made Dali feel confident and inspired. Enemies also give you a standard by which to judge yourself, both personally and socially. A tough opponent will bring out the best in you, and the bigger the opponent, the greater your reward, even in defeat. It is better to lose to a worthy opponent than to squash some harmless foe. You will gain sympathy and respect, building support for your next fight. Being attacked is a sign that you are important enough to be a target. You should relish the attention and the chance to prove yourself. We all have aggressive impulses that we are forced to repress. An enemy supplies you with an outlet for these drives. At last, you have someone on whom to unleash your aggression without feeling guilty. Leaders have always found it useful to have an enemy at their gates in times of trouble, distracting the public from their difficulties. In using your enemies to rally your troops, polarize them as far as possible. They will fight the more fiercely when they feel a little hatred. So exaggerate the differences between you and the enemy. Draw the lines clearly. Xenophon made no effort to be fair. He did not say that the Persians weren't really such a bad lot, and had done much to advance civilization. He called them barbarians, the antithesis of the Greeks. He described their recent treachery and said they were an evil culture that could find no favor with the gods. And so it is with you. Victory is your goal, not fairness and balance. Use the rhetoric of war to heighten the stakes and stimulate the spirit. Reversal Always keep the search for and use of enemies under control. It is clarity you want, not paranoia. It is the downfall of many tyrants to see an enemy in everyone. They lose their grip on reality and become hopelessly embroiled in the emotions their paranoia churns up. Also. 
Beware of polarizing people so completely that you cannot back off. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a master polarizer, always looking to draw a line between himself and his enemies. Once he made that line clear enough, though, he backed off, which made him look like a conciliator, a man of peace who occasionally went to war. Even if that impression was false, it was the height of wisdom to create it. 2. Do not fight the last war. The guerrilla war of the mind strategy. What most often weighs you down and brings you misery is the past, in the form of unnecessary attachments, repetitions of tired formulas, and the memory of old victories and defeats. You must consciously wage war against the past and force yourself to react to the present moment. Be ruthless on yourself. Do not repeat the same tired methods. Sometimes you must force yourself to strike out in new directions, even if they involve risk. What you may lose in comfort and security, you will gain in surprise, making it harder for your enemies to tell what you will do. Wage guerrilla war on your mind, allowing no static lines of defense, no exposed citadels. Make everything fluid and mobile. The Last War no one has risen to power faster than Napoleon Bonaparte, 1769-1821. In 1793, he went from captain in the French Revolutionary Army to brigadier general. In 1796, he became the leader of the French forces in Italy, fighting the Austrians, whom he crushed that year and again three years later. He became first consul of France in 1801, emperor in 1804. In 1805, he humiliated the Austrian and Russian armies at the Battle of Austerlitz. For many, Napoleon was more than a great general. He was a genius, a god of war. Not everyone was impressed, though. There were Prussian generals who thought he had merely been lucky. If he ever faced the Prussians, he would be revealed as a great fake. Among these Prussian generals was Friedrich Ludwig, Prince of Hohenlohe Ingelfingen. Hohenlohe came from one of Germany's oldest aristocratic families, one with an illustrious military record. To Hohenlohe, success in war depended on organization, discipline, and the use of superior strategies developed by trained military minds. The Prussians exemplified all of these virtues. Prussian soldiers drilled relentlessly until they could perform elaborate maneuvers as precisely as a machine. Prussian generals intensely studied the victories of Frederick the Great. War, for them, was a mathematical affair, the application of timeless principles. To the generals, Napoleon was a Corsican hothead, leading an unruly citizen's army. Superior in knowledge and skill, they would outstrategize him. The Napoleonic myth would lie in ruins, and Europe could return to its old ways. In August 1806, Hohenlohe and his fellow generals finally got what they wanted. King Friedrich Wilhelm III of Prussia, tired of Napoleon's broken promises, decided to declare war on him in six weeks. In the meantime, he asked his generals to come up with a plan to crush the French. Hohenlohe was ecstatic. The campaign would be the climax of his career. He had been thinking for years about how to beat Napoleon and he presented his plan to the general's first strategy session. Precise marches would place the army at the perfect angle from which to attack the French as they advanced through southern Prussia. An attack in oblique formation, Frederick the Great's favorite tactic, would deliver a devastating blow. The other generals, all in their sixties and seventies, presented their own plans, but these, too, were merely variants on the tactics of Frederick the Great. Discussion turned into argument. Several weeks went by. Finally, the king had to step in and create a compromise strategy that would satisfy all of his generals. A feeling of exuberance swept the country, which would soon relive the glory years of Frederick the Great. On October 5th, a few days before the king was to declare war, disturbing news reached the generals. A reconnaissance mission revealed that divisions of Napoleon's army, which they had believed was dispersed, had marched east, merged, and was massing deep in southern Prussia. 
The captain who had led the scouting mission reported that the French soldiers were marching with packs on their backs. Where the Prussians used slow-moving wagons to provision their troops, the French carried their own supplies and moved with astonishing speed and mobility. Before the generals had time to adjust their plans, Napoleon's army suddenly wheeled north, heading straight for Berlin, the heart of Prussia. The generals argued and dithered, moving their troops here and there, trying to decide where to attack. A mood of panic set in. Finally, the king ordered a retreat. The troops would reassemble to the north and attack Napoleon's flank as he advanced toward Berlin. Hohenlohe was in charge of the rear guard, protecting the Prussians' retreat. On October 14th, near the town of Jena, Napoleon caught up with Hohenlohe, who finally faced the battle he had wanted so desperately. The numbers on both sides were equal, but while the French were an unruly force, fighting pell-mell and on the run, Hohenlohe kept his troops in tight order, orchestrating them like a corps de ballet. The fighting went back and forth, until finally the French captured the village of Wirzenheiligen. Hohenlohe ordered his troops to retake the village. In a ritual dating back to Frederick the Great, a drum major beat out a cadence, and the Prussian soldiers, their colors flying, reformed their positions in perfect parade order, preparing to advance. They were in an open plain, though, and Napoleon's men were behind garden walls and on the house roofs. The Prussians fell like ninepins to the French marksmen. Confused, Hohenlohe ordered his soldiers to halt and change formation. The drums beat again. The Prussians marched with magnificent precision, always a sight to behold. But the French kept shooting, decimating the Prussian line. Never had Hohenlohe seen such an army. The French soldiers were like demons. Unlike his disciplined soldiers, they moved on their own, yet there was method to their madness. Suddenly, as if from nowhere, they rushed forward on both sides, threatening to surround the Prussians. The prince ordered a retreat. The Battle of Jena was over. Like a house of cards, the Prussians quickly crumbled, one fortress falling after another. The king fled east. In a matter of days, virtually nothing remained of the once mighty Prussian army. Interpretation The reality facing the Prussians in 1806 was simple. They had fallen fifty years behind the times. Their generals were old, and instead of responding to present circumstances, they were repeating formulas that had worked in the past. You might find the Prussian army just an interesting historical example, but in fact, you are likely marching in the same direction yourself. What limits individuals as well as nations is the inability to confront reality, to see things for what they are. As we grow older, we become more rooted in the past. Habit takes over. Something that has worked for us before becomes a doctrine, a shell to protect us from reality. Repetition replaces creativity. We rarely realize we're doing this, because it is almost impossible for us to see it happening in our own minds. Then, suddenly, a young Napoleon crosses our path, a person who does not respect tradition, who fights in a new way. Only then, do we see that our ways of thinking and responding have fallen behind the times? Never take it for granted that your past successes will continue into the future. Actually, your past successes are your biggest obstacle. Every battle, every war is different, and you cannot assume that what worked before will work today. You must cut yourself loose from the past and open your eyes to the present. Your tendency to fight the last war may lead to your final war. Keys to Warfare In looking back on an unpleasant or disagreeable experience, the thought inevitably occurs to us, if only we had said or done X instead of Y, if only we could do it over. Even Prince Hohenlohe, years later, could see how he had botched the retaking of Wirzenheiligen, the problem, though, is not that we think of the solution only when it is too late. The problem is that we imagine that knowledge is what was lacking. If only we had known more. If only we had thought it through more thoroughly. That is precisely the wrong approach. 
What makes us go astray in the first place is that we are unattuned to the present moment, insensitive to the circumstances. We are listening to our own thoughts, reacting to things that happened in the past, applying theories and ideas that were digested long ago, but that have nothing to do with our predicament in the present. More books, theories, and thinking only make the problem worse. Understand. The greatest generals, the most creative strategists, stand out not because they have more knowledge, but because they are able, when necessary, to drop their preconceived notions and focus intensely on the present moment. That is how creativity is sparked and opportunities are seized. Knowledge, experience, and theory have limitations. No amount of thinking in advance can prepare you for the chaos of life, for the infinite possibilities of the moment. The great philosopher of war, Karl von Clausewitz, called this friction, the difference between our plans and what actually happens. Since friction is inevitable, our minds have to be capable of keeping up with the change and adapting to the unexpected. The better we can adapt our thoughts to changing circumstances, the more realistic our responses to them will be. The more we lose ourselves in pre-digested theories and past experiences, the more inappropriate and delusional our response. It can be valuable to analyze what went wrong in the past, but it is far more important to develop the capacity to think in the moment. In that way, you will make far fewer mistakes to analyze. Think of the mind as a river. The faster it flows, the better it keeps up with the present and responds to change. The faster it flows, also, the more it refreshes itself and the greater its energy. Obsessional thoughts, past experiences, whether traumas or successes, and preconceived notions are like boulders or mud in this river, settling and hardening there and damming it up. The river stops moving, stagnation sets in. You must wage constant war on this tendency in the mind. The first step is simply to be aware of the process and of the need to fight it. The second is to adopt the few tactics that might help you to restore the mind's natural flow. Re-examine all of your cherished beliefs and principles. When Napoleon was asked what principles of war he followed, he replied that he followed none. His genius was his ability to respond to circumstances, to make the most of what he was given. He was the supreme opportunist. Your only principle, similarly, should be to have no principles. To believe that strategy has inexorable laws or timeless rules is to take up a rigid, static position. That will be your undoing. Be brutal with the past, with tradition, with the old ways of doing things. Declare war on sacred cows and voices of convention in your own head. Erase the memory of the last war. The last war you fought is a danger, even if you won it. If you were victorious, you will tend to repeat the strategies you just used, for success makes us lazy and complacent. If you lost, you may be skittish and indecisive. Do not think about the last war. Instead, do whatever you can to blot it from your mind. Ted Williams, perhaps baseball's greatest pure hitter, made a point of always trying to forget his last at-bat. Whether he'd gotten a home run or a strikeout, he put it behind him. No two at-bats are the same, even against the same pitcher, and Williams wanted an open mind. He would not wait for the next at-bat to start forgetting. The minute he got back to the dugout, he started focusing on what was happening in the game taking place. Attention to the details of the present is by far the best way to crowd out the past and forget the last war. Keep the mind moving. When we were children, our minds never stopped. We were open to new experiences and absorbed as much of them as possible. We learned fast because the world around us excited us. When we felt frustrated or upset, we would find some creative way to get what we wanted and then quickly forget the problem as something new crossed our path. All the greatest strategists, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Musashi, were childlike in this respect. Sometimes, in fact, they even acted like children. The reason is simple. Superior strategists see things as they are. 
They are highly sensitive to dangers and opportunities. Nothing stays the same in life, and keeping up with circumstances as they change requires a great deal of mental fluidity. Great strategists do not act according to preconceived ideas. They respond to the moment, like children. Their minds are always moving, and they are always excited and curious. They quickly forget the past. The present is much too interesting. Absorb the Spirit of the Times Throughout the history of warfare, there have been classic battles in which the past has confronted the future in a hopeless mismatch. In each case, the conquering army developed a way of fighting that maximized a new form of technology or a new social order. You can reproduce this effect on a smaller scale by attuning yourself to the spirit of the times. Developing antennae for the trends that have yet to crest takes work and study, as well as the flexibility to adapt to those trends. As you get older, it is best to periodically alter your style. By constantly adapting and changing your style, you will avoid the pitfalls of your previous wars. Just when people feel they know you, you will change. Reverse Course Relationships often develop a certain tiresome predictability. You do what you usually do, other people respond the way they usually do, and around it goes. If you reverse course, act in a novel manner, you alter the entire dynamic. Do this every so often to break up the relationship's stale patterns and open it to new possibilities. Think of your mind as an army. Armies must adapt to the complexity and chaos of modern war by becoming more fluid and maneuverable. The ultimate extension of this evolution is guerrilla warfare, which exploits chaos by making disorder and unpredictability a strategy. The guerrilla army never stops to defend a particular place or town. It wins by always moving, staying one step ahead. By following no set pattern, it gives the enemy no target. The guerrilla army never repeats the same tactic. It responds to the situation, the moment, the terrain where it happens to find itself. There is no front, no concrete line of communication or supply, no slow-moving wagon. The guerrilla army is pure mobility. That is the model for your new way of thinking. Apply no tactic rigidly. Do not let your mind settle into static positions, defending any particular place or idea, repeating the same lifeless maneuvers. Attack problems from new angles, adapting to the landscape and to what you're given. By staying in constant motion, you show your enemies no target to aim at. You exploit the chaos of the world instead of succumbing to it. Reversal There is never any value in fighting the last war. But while you're eliminating that pernicious tendency, you must imagine that your enemy is trying to do the same, trying to learn from and adapt to the present. Err on the side of caution. Be ready. Never. Let your enemy surprise you in war. Three. Amidst the turmoil of events, do not lose your presence of mind. The counterbalance strategy. In the heat of battle, the mind tends to lose its balance. Too many things confront you at the same time. Unexpected setbacks, doubts, and criticisms from your own allies. There's a danger of responding emotionally with fear, depression, or frustration. It is vital to keep your presence of mind, maintaining your mental powers, whatever the circumstances. You must actively resist the emotional pull of the moment, staying decisive, confident, and aggressive no matter what hits you. Make the mind tougher by exposing it to adversity. Learn to detach yourself from the chaos of the battlefield. Let others lose their heads. Your presence of mind will steer you clear of their influence and keep you on course. The Hyper-Aggressive Tactic Vice Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson, 1758-1805, had been through it all. He had lost his right eye in the Siege of Calvi and his right arm in the Battle of Tenerife. He had defeated the Spanish at Cape St. Vincent in 1797 and had thwarted Napoleon's Egyptian campaign by defeating his navy at the Battle of the Nile the following year. 
But none of his tribulations and triumphs prepared him for the problems he faced from his own colleagues in the British Navy as they prepared to go to war against Denmark in February 1801. Nelson, England's most glorious war hero, was the obvious choice to lead the fleet. Instead, the Admiralty chose Sir Hyde Parker, with Nelson his second in command. This war was a delicate business. It was intended to force the disobedient Danes to comply with a British-led embargo on the shipping of military goods to France. The fiery Nelson was prone to lose his cool. He hated Napoleon, and if he went too far against the Danes, he would produce a diplomatic fiasco. Sir Hyde was an older, more stable, even-tempered man who would do the job and nothing more. Nelson swallowed his pride and took the assignment, but he saw trouble ahead. He knew that time was of the essence. The faster the Navy sailed, the less chance the Danes would have to build up their defenses. The ships were ready to sail, but Parker's motto was, Everything in good order. It wasn't his style to hurry. Nelson burned for action. He reviewed intelligence reports, studied maps, and came up with a detailed plan for fighting the Danes. He wrote to Parker urging him to seize the initiative. Parker ignored him. At last, on March 11th, the British fleet set sail. Instead of heading for Copenhagen, however, Parker anchored well to the north of the city's harbor and called a meeting of his captains. According to intelligence reports, he explained, the Danes had prepared elaborate defenses for Copenhagen. Boats anchored in the harbor, forts to the north and south, and mobile artillery batteries could blast the British out of the water. How to fight this artillery without terrible losses? Also, pilots who knew the waters around Copenhagen reported that they were treacherous, places of sandbars and tricky winds. Navigating these dangers under bombardment would be harrowing. With all of these difficulties, perhaps it was best to wait for the Danes to leave harbor and then fight them in open sea. Nelson struggled to control himself. Finally, he let loose, pacing the room, the stub of his lost arm jerking as he spoke. No war, he said, had ever been won by waiting. The Danish defenses looked formidable to those who are children at war, but he had worked out a strategy weeks earlier. He would attack from the south, the easier approach, while Parker and a reserve force would stay to the city's north. Nelson would use his mobility to take out the Danish guns. He had studied the maps. Sandbars were no threat. As for the wind, aggressive action was more important than fretting over wind. Nelson's speech energized Parker's captains. He was by far their most successful leader, and his confidence was catching. Even Sir Hyde was impressed, and the plan was approved. The next morning, Nelson's line of ships advanced on Copenhagen, and the battle began. The Danish guns, firing on the British at close range, took a fierce toll. Nelson paced the deck of his flagship, HMS Elephant, urging his men on. He was in an excited, almost ecstatic state. A shot through the main mast nearly hit him. It is warm work, and this day may be the last to any of us at any moment, he told a colonel, a little shaken up by the blast. But mark you, I would not be elsewhere for thousands. Parker followed the battle from his position to the north. He now regretted agreeing to Nelson's plan. He was responsible for the campaign, and a defeat here could ruin his career. After four hours of back-and-forth bombardment, he had seen enough. The fleet had taken a beating and had gained no advantage. Nelson never knew when to quit. Parker decided it was time to hoist signal flag 39, the order to withdraw. The first ships to see it were to acknowledge it and pass the signal on down the line. Once acknowledged, there was nothing else to do but retreat. The battle was over. On board the Elephant, a lieutenant told Nelson about the signal. The vice-admiral ignored it. Continuing to pound the Danish defenses, he eventually called to an officer, Is number 16 still hoisted? Number 16 was his own flag. It meant engage the enemy more closely. The officer confirmed that the flag was still flying. Mind you, keep it so, Nelson told him. A few minutes later, Parker's signal still flapping in the breeze, Nelson turned to his flag captain. 
You know, Foley, I have only one eye. I have a right to be blind sometimes. And raising his telescope to his blind eye, he calmly remarked, I really do not see the signal. Torn between obeying Parker and obeying Nelson, the fleet captains chose Nelson. They would risk their careers along with his. But soon the Danish defenses started to crack. Some of the ships anchored in the harbor surrendered, and the firing of the guns began to slow. Less than an hour after Parker's signal to stop the battle, the Danes surrendered. The next day, Parker perfunctorily congratulated Nelson on the victory. He did not mention his subordinate's disobedience. He was hoping the whole affair, including his own lack of courage, would be quietly forgotten. Interpretation When the Admiralty put its faith in Sir Hyde, it made a classic military error. It entrusted the waging of a war to a man who was careful and methodical. Such men may seem calm, even strong, in times of peace, but their self-control often hides weakness. The reason they think things through so carefully is that they are terrified of making a mistake and of what that might mean for them and their career. This doesn't come out until they are tested in battle. Suddenly, they cannot make a decision. They see problems everywhere and defeat in the smallest setback. They hang back, not out of patience, but out of fear. Often these moments of hesitation spell their doom. Presence of mind is a kind of counterbalance to mental weakness, to our tendency to get emotional and lose perspective in the heat of battle. Our greatest weakness is losing heart, doubting ourselves, becoming unnecessarily cautious. Being more careful is not what we need. That is just a screen for our fear of conflict and of making a mistake. What we need is double the resolve an intensification of confidence. That will serve as a counterbalance. In moments of turmoil and trouble, you must force yourself to be more determined. Call up the aggressive energy you need to overcome caution and inertia. Any mistakes you make, you can rectify with more energetic action still. Save your carefulness for the hours of preparation, but once the fighting begins, empty your mind of doubts Ignore those who quail at any setback and call for retreat. Find joy in attack mode. Momentum will carry you through. Keys to Warfare Our minds seem rather strong when we're following our routines. But place any of us in an adverse situation and our rationality vanishes. We react to pressure by growing fearful, impatient, confused. Such moments reveal us for the emotional creatures we are. Under attack, whether by a known enemy or unpredictably by a colleague, our response is dominated by feelings of anger, sadness, betrayal. Only with great effort can we reason our way through these periods and respond rationally, and our rationality rarely lasts past the next attack. Understand, your mind is weaker than your emotions. But you become aware of this weakness only in moments of adversity, precisely the time when you need strength. What best equips you to cope with the heat of battle is neither more knowledge nor more intellect. What makes your mind stronger and more able to control your emotions is internal discipline and toughness. No one can teach you this skill. You cannot learn it by reading about it. Like any discipline, it can come only through practice experience, even a little suffering. The first step in building up presence of mind is to see the need for it, to want it badly enough to be willing to work for it. Historical figures who stand out for their presence of mind, Alexander the Great, Ulysses S. Grant, Winston Churchill, acquired it through adversity, through trial and error. They were in positions of responsibility in which they had to develop this quality or sink. Although these men may have been blessed with an unusual amount of personal fortitude, they had to work hard to strengthen this into presence of mind. The ideas that follow are based on their experience and hard-won victories. Think of these ideas as exercises, ways to toughen your mind, each a kind of counterbalance to emotion's overpowering pull. Expose yourself to conflict. 
George S. Patton, came from one of America's most distinguished military families. But Patton was also a sensitive young man, and he had one deep fear that in battle he would turn coward and disgrace the family name. Patton had his first real taste of battle in 1918, at the age of 32, during the Allied offensive on the Argonne during World War I. He commanded a tank division. At one point during the battle, Patton managed to lead some American infantrymen to a position on a hilltop overlooking a key strategic town. But German fire forced them to take cover. Soon it became clear that they were trapped. If they retreated, they would come under fire from positions on the sides of the hill. If they advanced, they would run right into a battery of German machine guns. If they were all to die, as it seemed to Patton, better to die advancing. At the moment he was to lead the troops in the charge, however, Patton was stricken by intense fear. His body trembled and his legs turned to jelly. In a confirmation of his deepest fears, he had lost his nerve. At that instant, looking into the clouds beyond the German batteries, Patton had a vision. He saw his illustrious military ancestors, all in their uniforms, staring sternly down at him. They seemed to be inviting him to join their company, the company of dead war heroes. Paradoxically, the sight of these men had a calming effect on the young Patton. Calling for volunteers to follow him, he yelled, It is time for another Patton to die. The strength had returned to his legs. He stood up and charged toward the German guns. Seconds later he fell, hit in the thigh. But he survived the battle. From that moment on, even after he became a general, Patton made a point of visiting the front lines, exposing himself needlessly to danger. He tested himself again and again. His vision of his ancestors remained a constant stimulus, a challenge to his honor. Each time it became easier to face down his fears. It seemed to his fellow generals and to his own men that no one had more presence of mind than Patton. They did not know how much of his strength was an effort of will. The story of Patton teaches us two things. First, it is better to confront your fears let them come to the surface, then to ignore them or tamp them down. The sensation of overcoming a deep-rooted fear gives you confidence and presence of mind. The more conflicts and difficult situations you put yourself through, the more battle-tested your mind will be. Second, Patton's experience demonstrates the motivating power of a sense of honor and dignity. In giving in to fear, in losing your presence of mind, you disgrace not only yourself, your self-image, and your reputation, but your company, your family, your group. You bring down the communal spirit. Being a leader of even the smallest group gives you something to live up to. People are watching you, judging you, depending on you. To lose your composure would make it hard for you to live with yourself. Be self-reliant. There is nothing worse than feeling dependent on other people. Dependency makes you vulnerable to all kinds of emotions, betrayal, disappointment, frustration, that play havoc with your mental balance. To make yourself less dependent on others and so-called experts, you need to expand your repertoire of skills. And you need to feel more confident in your own judgment. Understand. We tend to overestimate other people's abilities. After all, they're trying hard to make it look as if they knew what they were doing. And we tend to underestimate our own. You must compensate for this by trusting yourself more and others less. It is important to remember, though, that being self-reliant does not mean burdening yourself with petty details. You must be able to distinguish between small matters that are best left to others and larger issues that require your attention and care. Suffer fools gladly. The world is full of fools, people who cannot wait to get results, who change with the wind, who can't see past their noses. You encounter them everywhere. The indecisive boss, the rash colleague, the hysterical subordinate. When working alongside fools, do not fight them. 
Instead, think of them the way you think of children or pets, not important enough to affect your mental balance. Detach yourself emotionally. And while you're inwardly laughing at their foolishness, indulge them in one of their more harmless ideas. The ability to stay cheerful in the face of fools is an important skill. Crowd out feelings of panic by focusing on simple tasks. When circumstances scare us, our imagination tends to take over, filling our minds with endless anxieties. You need to gain control of your imagination, something easier said than done. Often the best way to calm down and give yourself such control is to force the mind to concentrate on something relatively simple, a calming ritual, a repetitive task that you are good at. You are creating the kind of composure you naturally have when your mind is absorbed in a problem. A focused mind has no room for anxiety or for the effects of an overactive imagination. Once you have regained your mental balance, you can then face the problem at hand. At the first sign of any kind of fear, practice this technique until it becomes a habit. Being able to control your imagination at intense moments is a crucial skill. Unintimidate yourself. Intimidation will always threaten your presence of mind, and it is a hard feeling to combat. The key to staying unintimidated is to convince yourself that the person you're facing is a mere mortal, no different from you, which is, in fact, the truth. See the person, not the myth. Imagine him or her as a child, as someone riddled with insecurities. Cutting the person down to size will help you to keep your mental balance. Develop your Fingerspitzengefühl, fingertip feel. Presence of mind depends not only on your mind's ability to come to your aid in difficult situations, but also on the speed with which this happens. Waiting until the next day to think of the right action to take does you no good at all. Speed here means responding to circumstances with rapidity and making lightning-quick decisions. This power is often read as a kind of intuition, what the Germans call Fingerspitzengefühl, fingertip feel. Erwin Rommel, who led the German tank campaign in North Africa during World War II, had great fingertip feel. He could sense when the Allies would attack and from what direction. In choosing a line of advance, he had an uncanny feel for his enemy's weakness. At the start of a battle, he could intuit his enemy's strategy before it unfolded. Rommel didn't just study his men, his tanks, the terrain, and the enemy. He got inside their skin, understood the spirit that animated them, what made them tick. Having felt his way into these things in battle, he entered a state of mind in which he did not have to think consciously of the situation. The totality of what was going on in his blood at his fingertips. He had Fingerspitzengefühl. Whether or not you have the mind of a Rommel, there are things you can do to help you respond faster and bring out the intuitive feel that all animals possess. Deep knowledge of the terrain will let you process information faster than your enemy, a tremendous advantage. Getting a feel for the spirit of men and material, thinking your way into them instead of looking at them from outside, will help to put you in a different frame of mind, less conscious and forced, more unconscious and intuitive. Get your mind into the habit of making lightning-quick decisions, trusting your fingertip feel. Your mind will advance in a kind of mental blitzkrieg, moving past your opponents before they realize what has hit them. Finally, do not think of presence of mind as a quality useful only in periods of adversity, something to switch off and on as you need it, cultivate it as an everyday condition. Confidence, fearlessness, and self-reliance are as crucial in times of peace as in times of war. Reversal you do not want to lose your presence of mind in key situations, but it is a wise course to find a way to make your enemies lose theirs. Take what throws you off balance and impose it on them. 4. Create a sense of urgency and desperation. The Death Ground Strategy 
You are your own worst enemy. You waste precious time dreaming of the future instead of engaging in the present. Since nothing seems urgent to you, you are only half involved in what you do. The only way to change is through action and outside pressure. Put yourself in situations where you have too much at stake to waste time or resources. If you cannot afford to lose, you won't. Cut your ties to the past. Enter unknown territory where you must depend on your wits and energy to see you through. Place yourself on death ground, where your back is against the wall and you have to fight like hell to get out alive. The No Return Tactic In 1504, an ambitious 19-year-old Spaniard named Hernán Cortés gave up his studies in law and sailed for his country's colonies in the New World. Stopping first in Santo Domingo, the island today comprising Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Then, in Cuba, he soon heard about a land to the west called Mexico, an empire teeming with gold and dominated by the Aztecs, with their magnificent highland capital of Tenochtitlan. From then on, Cortes had just one thought. Someday, he would conquer and settle the land of Mexico. Over the next ten years, Cortes slowly rose through the ranks, eventually becoming secretary to the Spanish governor of Cuba, and then the king's treasurer for the island. In his own mind, though, he was merely biding his time. He waited patiently while Spain sent other men to Mexico, many of them never to return. Finally, in 1518, the governor of Cuba, Diego de Velasquez, made Cortes the leader of an expedition to discover what had happened to these earlier explorers, find gold, and lay the groundwork for the country's conquest. Velasquez wanted to make that future conquest himself, however, so for this expedition he wanted a man he could control, and he soon developed doubts about Cortes. The man was clever, perhaps too much so. Word reached Cortes that the governor was having second thoughts about sending him to Mexico. Deciding to give Velasquez no time to nurse his misgivings, he managed to slip out of Cuba in the middle of the night with eleven ships. He would explain himself to the governor later. The expedition landed on Mexico's east coast in March 1519. Over the next few months, Cortes put his plans to work founding the town of Veracruz, forging alliances with local tribes who hated the Aztecs, and making initial contact with the Aztec emperor, whose capital lay some 250 miles to the west. But one problem plagued the conquistador. Among the 500 soldiers who had sailed with him from Cuba were a handful who had been placed there by Velasquez to act as spies and make trouble for him if he exceeded his authority. These Velasquez loyalists accused Cortes of mismanaging the gold that he was collecting, and when it became clear that he intended to conquer Mexico, they spread rumors that he was insane, an all-too-convincing accusation to make about a man planning to lead five hundred men against half a million Aztecs, fierce warriors known to eat their prisoners' flesh and wear the skins as trophies. A rational man would take the gold they had, return to Cuba, and come back later with an army. Why stay in this forbidding land with its diseases and its lack of creature comforts when they were so heavily outnumbered? Why not sail for Cuba, back home where their farms, their wives, and the good life awaited them? Cortes did what he could with these troublemakers, bribing some, keeping a close eye on others. Meanwhile, he worked to build a strong enough rapport with the rest of his men that the grumblers could do no harm. All seemed well until the night of July 30th, when Cortes was awoken by a Spanish sailor who, begging for mercy, confessed that he had joined in a plot to steal a ship and return that very evening to Cuba, where the conspirators would tell Velasquez about Cortes's goal of conquering Mexico on his own. Cortes sensed that this was the decisive moment of the expedition. He could easily squash the conspiracy but there would be others. His men were a rough lot, and their minds were on gold, Cuba, their families, anything but fighting the Aztecs. He could not conquer an empire with men so divided and untrustworthy, but how to fill them with the energy and focus for the immense task he faced? Thinking this through, he decided to take swift action. 
he seized the conspirators and had the two ringleaders hanged. Next, he bribed his pilots to bore holes in all of the ships and then announced that worms had eaten through the boards of the vessels, making them unseaworthy. Pretending to be upset at the news, Cortez ordered what was salvageable from the ships to be taken ashore and then the holes to be sunk. The pilots complied, but not enough holes had been bored, and only five of the ships went down. The story of the worms was plausible enough, and the soldiers accepted the news of the five ships with equanimity. But when a few days later more ships were run aground and only one was left afloat, it was clear to them that Cortez had arranged the whole thing. When he called a meeting, their mood was mutinous and murderous. This was no time for subtlety. Cortez addressed his men. He was responsible for the disaster, he admitted. He had ordered it done, but now there was no turning back. They could hang him, but they were surrounded by hostile Indians and had no ships. Divided and leaderless, they would perish. The only alternative was to follow him to Tenochtitlan. Only by conquering the Aztecs, by becoming lords of Mexico, could they get back to Cuba alive. To reach Tenochtitlan, they would have to fight with utter intensity. They would have to be unified. Any dissension would lead to defeat and a terrible death. The situation was desperate, but if the men fought desperately in turn, Cortes guaranteed that he would lead them to victory. Since the army was so small in number, the glory and riches would be all the greater. Any cowards not up to the challenge could sail the one remaining ship home. No one accepted the offer, and the last ship, was run aground. Over the next months, Cortes kept his army away from Veracruz and the coast. Their attention was focused on Tenochtitlan, the heart of the Aztec Empire. The grumbling, the self-interest, and the greed all disappeared. Understanding the danger of their situation, the conquistadors fought ruthlessly. Some two years after the destruction of the Spanish ships, and with the help of their Indian allies, Cortez's army laid siege to Tenochtitlan and conquered the Aztec Empire. Interpretation For Cortez's soldiers, the ships were a crutch, something to fall back on if things got ugly. Once Cortez had identified the problem, the solution was simple, destroy the ships. By putting his men in a desperate place, he would make them fight with utmost intensity. A sense of urgency comes from a powerful connection to the present. Instead of dreaming of rescue or hoping for a better future, you have to face the issue at hand. Fail, and you perish. People who involve themselves completely in the immediate problem are intimidating because they are focusing so intensely they seem more powerful than they are. Their sense of urgency multiplies their strength and gives them momentum. Instead of five hundred men, Cortes suddenly had the weight of a much larger army at his back. Like Cortes, you must locate the root of your problem. It is not the people around you, it is yourself, and the spirit with which you face the world. In the back of your mind, you keep an escape route, a crutch, something to turn to if things go bad. Maybe it is some wealthy relative you can count on to buy your way out. Maybe it is some grand opportunity on the horizon, the endless vistas of time that seem to be before you. Maybe it is a familiar job or a comfortable relationship that is always there, if you fail. Just as Cortez's men saw their ships as insurance, you may see this fallback as a blessing, but in fact, it is a curse. It divides you. Because you think you have options, you never involve yourself deeply enough in one thing to do it thoroughly, and you never quite get what you want. Sometimes you need to run your ships aground, burn them, and leave yourself just one option. Succeed or go down. Make the burning of your ships as real as possible. Get rid of your safety net. Sometimes you have to become a little desperate to get anywhere. Keys to Warfare Leaders of armies have thought about this subject since armies existed. How can soldiers be motivated, be made more aggressive, more desperate? Some generals have relied on fiery oratory, and those particularly good at it have had some success. But over 2,000 years ago, 
the Chinese strategist Sun Tzu came to believe that listening to speeches, no matter how rousing, was too passive an experience to have an enduring effect. Instead, Sun Tzu talked of a death ground, a place where an army is backed up against some geographical feature, like a mountain, a river, or a forest, and has no escape route. Without a way to retreat, Sun Tzu argued, an army fights with double or triple the spirit it would have on open terrain, because death is viscerally present. Sun Tzu advocated deliberately stationing soldiers on death ground to give them the desperate edge that makes men fight like the devil. That is what Cortes did in Mexico, and it is the only sure way to create a real fire in the belly. The world is ruled by necessity. People change their behavior only if they have to. They will feel urgency only if their lives depend on it. Death ground is a psychological phenomenon that goes well beyond the battlefield. It is any set of circumstances in which you feel enclosed and without options. There is very real pressure at your back, and you cannot retreat. Time is running out. Failure, a form of psychic death, is staring you in the face. You must act or suffer the consequences. The trick is to use this effect deliberately from time to time, to practice it on yourself as a kind of wake-up call. The following five actions are designed to put you on a psychological death ground. Reading and thinking about them won't work. You must put them into effect. They are forms of pressure to apply to yourself. Depending on whether you want a low-intensity jolt for regular use or a real shock, you can turn the level up or down. The scale is up to you. Stake everything on a single throw. Often we try too many things at one time, thinking that one of them will bring us success. But in these situations, our minds are diffused, our efforts half-hearted. It is better to take on one daunting challenge, even one that others think foolish. Our future is at stake. We cannot afford to lose. So we don't. Act before you are ready. We often wait too long to act, particularly when we face no outside pressure. It is sometimes better to act before you think you are ready to force the issue. Not only will you take your opponent by surprise, you will also have to make the most of your resources. You have committed yourself and cannot turn back. Under pressure, your creativity will flourish. Do this often, and you will develop your ability to think and act fast. Enter new waters. Sometimes you have to force yourself onto death ground leaving stale relationships and comfortable situations behind, cutting your ties to the past. If you give yourself no way out, you will have to make your new endeavor work. Leaving the past for unknown terrain is like death, and feeling this finality will snap you back to life. Make it you against the world. A fighting spirit needs a little edge, some anger and hatred to fuel it. So do not sit back and wait for people to get aggressive. Irritate and infuriate them deliberately. Feeling cornered by a multitude of people who dislike you, you will fight like hell. Hatred is a powerful emotion. Remember, in any battle, you are putting your name and reputation on the line. Your enemies will relish your failure. Use that pressure to make yourself fight harder. Keep yourself restless and unsatisfied. When we are tired, it is often because we are bored. When no real challenge faces us, a mental and physical lethargy sets in. Sometimes death only comes from a lack of energy, Napoleon once said, and lack of energy comes from a lack of challenges, comes when we have taken on less than we are capable of. Take a risk, and your body and mind will respond with a rush of energy. Make risk a constant practice. Never let yourself settle down. Soon, living on death ground will become a kind of addiction. You won't be able to do without it. When soldiers survive a brush with death, they often feel an exhilaration that they want to have again. Life has more meaning in the face of death. The risks you keep taking, the challenges you keep overcoming, are like symbolic deaths that sharpen your appreciation of life. 
Reversal. If the feeling of having nothing to lose can propel you forward, it can do the same for others. You must avoid any conflict with people in this position. Maybe they are living in terrible conditions or, for whatever reason, are suicidal. In any case, they are desperate, and desperate people will risk everything in a fight. This gives them a huge advantage. Already defeated by circumstances, they have nothing to lose. You do. Leave them alone. Part 2 Organizational Team Warfare You may have brilliant ideas, you may be able to invent unbeatable strategies, but if the group that you depend on to execute your plans is unresponsive and uncreative, and if its members always put their personal agendas first, your ideas will mean nothing. You must learn the lesson of war. It is the structure of the army, the chain of command, and the relationship of the parts to the whole that will give your strategies force. The primary goal in war is to build speed and mobility into the very structure of your army. That means having a single authority on top, avoiding the hesitancy and confusion of divided leadership. It means giving soldiers a sense of the overall goal to be accomplished and the latitude to take action to meet that goal. Instead of reacting like automatons, they are able to respond to events in the field. Finally, it means motivating soldiers, creating an overall esprit de corps that gives them irresistible momentum. With forces organized in this manner, a general can adapt to circumstances faster than the enemy can, gaining a decided advantage. The military model is extremely adaptable to any group. It has one simple requirement. Before formulating a strategy or taking action, understand the structure of your group. You can always change it and redesign it to fit your purposes. The following three sections of this program will help you focus on this critical issue and give you strategic options, possible organizational models to follow, as well as disastrous mistakes to avoid. 5. Avoid the snares of groupthink, the command and control strategy. The problem in leading any group is that people inevitably have their own agendas. If you are too authoritarian, they will resent you and rebel in silent ways. If you are too easygoing, they will revert to their natural selfishness and you will lose control. You have to create a chain of command in which people do not feel constrained by your influence, yet follow your lead. Put the right people in place, people who will enact the spirit of your ideas without being automatons. Make your commands clear and inspiring, focusing attention on the team, not the leader. Create a sense of participation, but do not fall into groupthink, the irrationality of collective decision-making. Make yourself look like a paragon of fairness, but never relinquish unity of command. Remote Control In the late 1930s, U.S. Brigadier General George C. Marshall 1880-1958, preached the need for major military reform. The army had too few soldiers, they were badly trained, current doctrine was ill-suited to modern technology. The list of problems went on. In 1939, President Franklin D. Roosevelt had to select his next army chief of staff. The appointment was critical. World War II had begun in Europe, and Roosevelt believed that the United States was sure to get involved. He understood the need for military reform, so he bypassed generals with more seniority and experience and chose Marshall for the job. The appointment was a curse in disguise, for the War Department was hopelessly dysfunctional. Many of its generals had monstrous egos and the power to impose their way of doing things. Senior officers, instead of retiring, took jobs in the department, amassing power bases and fiefdoms that they did everything they could to protect. A place of feuds, waste, communication breakdowns, and overlapping jobs. The department was a mess. How could Marshall revamp the army for global war if he could not control it? How could he create order and efficiency? Some ten years earlier, Marshall had served as the assistant commander of the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia, 
where he had trained many officers. Throughout his time there, he had kept a notebook in which he recorded the names of promising young men. Soon after becoming chief of staff, Marshall began to retire the older officers in the War Department and replace them with these younger men, whom he had personally trained. These officers were ambitious, they shared his desire for reform, and he encouraged them to speak their minds and show initiative. They included men like Omar Bradley and Mark Clark, who would be crucial in World War II, but no one was more important than the protege Marshall spent the most time on, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The relationship began a few days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, when Marshall asked Eisenhower, then a colonel, to prepare a report on what should be done in the Far East. The report showed Marshall that Eisenhower shared his ideas on how to run the war. For the next few months, he kept Eisenhower in the War Plans Division and watched him closely. The two men met every day. And in that time, Eisenhower soaked up Marshall's style of leadership, his way of getting things done. Marshall tested Eisenhower's patience by indicating that he planned to keep him in Washington instead of giving him the field assignment that he desperately wanted. The colonel passed the test. Much like Marshall himself, he got along well with other officers, yet was quietly forceful. In July 1942, as the Americans prepared to enter the war by fighting alongside the British in North Africa, Marshall surprised one and all by naming Eisenhower commander in the European theater of operations. Eisenhower was, by this time, a lieutenant general, but was still relatively unknown, and in his first few months in the job, as the Americans fared poorly in North Africa, the British clamored for a replacement. But Marshall stood by his man, offering him advice and encouragement. One key suggestion was for Eisenhower to develop a protege, much as Marshall had with him, a kind of roving deputy who thought the way he did and would act as his go-between with subordinates. Marshall's suggestion for the post was Major General Bradley, a man he knew well. Eisenhower accepted the idea, essentially duplicating the staff structure that Marshall had created in the War Department. With Bradley in place, Marshall left Eisenhower alone. Marshall positioned his protégés throughout the War Department, where they quietly spread his way of doing things. To make the task easier, he cut the waste in the department with utter ruthlessness, reducing from sixty to six the number of deputies who reported to him. Marshall hated excess. His reports to Roosevelt made him famous for his ability to summarize a complex situation in a few pages. The six men who reported to him found that any report that lasted a page too long simply went unread. He would listen to their oral presentations with rapt attention, but the minute they wandered from the topic or said something not thought through, he would look away, bored, uninterested. It was an expression they dreaded. Without saying a word, he had made it known that they had displeased him, and it was time for them to leave. Marshall's six deputies began to think like him, and to demand from those who reported to them the efficiency and streamlined communication style he demanded of them. The speed of the information flow up and down the line was now quadrupled. Marshall exuded authority, but never yelled and never challenged men frontally. He had a knack for communicating his wishes indirectly a skill that was all the more effective since it made his officers think about what he meant. Brigadier General Leslie R. Groves, the military director of the project to develop the atom bomb, once came to Marshall's office to get him to sign off on $100 million in expenditures. Finding the chief of staff engrossed in paperwork, he waited while Marshall diligently compared documents and made notes. Finally, Marshall put down his pen, examined the $100 million request, signed it, and returned it to Groves without a word. The general thanked him and was turning to leave when Marshall finally spoke. It may interest you to know what I was doing. I was writing the check for $3.52 for grass seed for my lawn. The thousands who worked under Marshall, whether in the War Department or abroad in the field, did not have to see him personally to feel his presence. They felt it in the terse but insightful reports that reached them from his deputies. 
in the speed of the responses to their questions and requests, in the department's efficiency and team spirit. They felt it in the leadership style of men like Eisenhower, who had absorbed Marshall's diplomatic yet forceful way of doing things. In a few short years, Marshall transformed the War Department and the U.S. Army. Few really understood how he had done it. Interpretation When Marshall became Chief of Staff, he knew that he would have to hold himself back. The temptation was to do combat with everyone in every problem area. The recalcitrance of the generals, the political feuds, the layers of waste. But Marshall was too smart to give in to that temptation. He had to rule indirectly through others, controlling with such a light touch that no one would realize how thoroughly he dominated. The key to Marshall's strategy was his selection, grooming, and placement of his protégés. He metaphorically cloned himself in these men, who enacted the spirit of his reforms on his behalf, saving him time and making him appear not as a manipulator, but as a delegator. Like the War Department that Marshall inherited, today's world is complex and chaotic. It is harder than ever to exercise control through a chain of command. You cannot supervise everything yourself. You cannot keep your eye on everyone. Being seen as a dictator will do you harm, but if you submit to complexity and let go of the chain of command, chaos will consume you. The solution is to do as Marshall did, operate through a kind of remote control. Hire deputies who share your vision but can think on their own, acting as you would in their place. Instead of wasting time negotiating with every difficult person, work on spreading a spirit of camaraderie and efficiency that becomes self-policing. Streamline the organization, cutting out waste, in staff, in the irrelevant reports on your desk, in pointless meetings. The less attention you spend on petty details, the more time you will have for the larger picture, for asserting your authority generally and indirectly. People will follow your lead without feeling bullied. That is the ultimate in control. Keys to Warfare Now, more than ever, effective leadership requires a deft and subtle touch. The reason is simple. We have grown more distrustful of authority. At the same time, almost all of us imagine ourselves as authorities in our own right, officers, not foot soldiers. Feeling the need to assert themselves, people today put their own interests before the team. Group unity is fragile and can easily crack. These trends affect leaders in ways they barely know. The tendency is to give more power to the group. Wanting to seem democratic, leaders poll the whole staff for opinions, let the group make decisions, give subordinates input into the crafting of an overall strategy. Without realizing it, these leaders are letting the politics of the day seduce them into violating one of the most important rules of warfare and leadership, unity of command. Before it is too late, learn the lessons of war. Divided leadership is a recipe for disaster, the cause of the greatest military defeats in history. Among the foremost of these defeats was the Battle of Cannae in 216 B.C., between the Romans and the Carthaginians, led by Hannibal. The Romans outnumbered the Carthaginians two to one, but were virtually annihilated in a perfectly executed strategic envelopment. Hannibal, of course, was a military genius, but the Romans take much of the blame for their own defeat. They had a faulty command system, with two tribunes sharing leadership of the army. Disagreeing over how to fight Hannibal, these men fought each other as much as they fought him and they made a mess of things. Divided leadership is dangerous because people in groups often think and act in ways that are illogical and ineffective. Call it group think. People in groups are political. They say and do things that they think will help their image within the group. They aim to please others, to promote themselves, rather than to see things dispassionately. Where an individual can be bold and creative, a group is often afraid of risk. The need to find a compromise among all the different egos kills creativity. The group has a mind of its own, and that mind is cautious, slow to decide, unimaginative, and sometimes downright irrational.
This is the game you must play. Do whatever you can to preserve unity of command. Keep the strings to be pulled in your hands. The overarching strategic vision must come from you and you alone. At the same time, hide your tracks. Work behind the scenes. Make the group feel involved in your decisions. Seek their advice, incorporating their good ideas, politely deflecting their bad ones. If necessary, make minor cosmetic strategy changes to assuage the insecure political animals in the group. But ultimately, trust your own vision. Remember the dangers of group decision-making. The first rule of effective leadership is never to relinquish your unity of command. A critical step in creating an efficient chain of command is assembling a skilled team that shares your goals and values. That team gives you many advantages, spirited, motivated people who can think on their own, an image as a delegator, a fair and democratic leader, and a saving in your own valuable energy, which you can redirect toward a larger picture. In creating this team, you are looking for people who make up for your deficiencies, who have the skills you lack. Be careful in assembling this team that you are not seduced by expertise and intelligence. Character, the ability to work under you and with the rest of the team, and the capacity to accept responsibility and think independently are equally key. That is why Marshall tested Eisenhower for so long. You may not have as much time to spare, but never choose a man merely by his glittering resume. Look beyond his skills to his psychological makeup. Rely on the team you have assembled, but do not be its prisoner or give it undue influence. Franklin D. Roosevelt had his infamous brain trust, the advisors and cabinet members on whom he depended for their ideas and opinions, but he never let them in on the actual decision-making and he kept them from building up their own power base within the administration. He saw them simply as tools, extending his own abilities and saving him valuable time. He understood unity of command and was never seduced into violating it. A key function of any chain of command is to supply information rapidly from the trenches, letting you adapt fast to circumstances. The shorter and more streamlined the chain of command, the better for the flow of information. Even so, information is often diluted as it passes up the chain. The telling details that reveal so much become standardized and general as they are filtered through formal channels. Some on the chain, too, will interpret the information for you, filtering what you hear. To get more direct knowledge, you might occasionally want to visit the field yourself. Marshall would sometimes drop in on an army base incognito to see with his own eyes how his reforms were taking effect. He would also read letters from soldiers. But in these days of increasing complexity, this can consume far too much of your time. What you need is what the military historian Martin Van Creveld calls a directed telescope. People in various parts of the chain and elsewhere to give you instant information from the battlefield. These people, an informal network of friends, allies, and spies, let you bypass the slow-moving chain. In general, it is important to cultivate these directed telescopes and plant them throughout the group. They give you flexibility in the chain, room to maneuver in a generally rigid environment. The single greatest risk to your chain of command comes from the political animals in the group. People like this are inescapable. They spring up like weeds in any organization. Not only are they out for themselves, but they would build factions to further their own agendas and fracture the cohesion you have built. Interpreting your commands for their own purposes, finding loopholes in any ambiguity, they create invisible breaks in the chain. Try to weed them out before they arrive. In hiring your team, look at the candidates' histories. Are they restless? Do they often move from place to place? That is a sign of the kind of ambition that will keep them from fitting in. When people seem to share your ideas exactly, be wary. They are probably mirroring them to charm you. Do not be naive. Once you identify the moles in the group, you must act fast to stop them from building a power base from which to destroy your authority. 
Finally, pay attention to the orders themselves, their form as well as their substance. Vague orders are worthless. As they pass from person to person, they are hopelessly altered, and your staff comes to see them as symbolizing uncertainty and indecision. It is critical that you yourself be clear about what you want before issuing your orders. On the other hand, if your commands are too specific and too narrow, you will encourage people to behave like automatons and stop thinking for themselves, which they must do when the situation requires it. Erring in neither direction is an art. Reversal No good can ever come of divided leadership. If you are ever offered a position in which you will have to share a command, turn it down, for the enterprise will fail and you will be held responsible. Better to take a lower position and let the other person have the job. 6. Segment your forces. The Controlled Chaos Strategy The critical elements in war are speed and adaptability, the ability to move and make decisions faster than the enemy. But speed and adaptability are hard to achieve today. We have more information than ever before at our fingertips, making interpretation and decision-making more difficult. We have more people to manage, those people are more widely spread, and we face more uncertainty. Learn from Napoleon, warfare's greatest master. Speed and adaptability come from flexible organization. Break your forces into independent groups that can operate and make decisions on their own. Make your forces elusive and unstoppable by infusing them with the spirit of the campaign, giving them a mission to accomplish, and then letting them run. Calculated Disorder In 1800, by defeating Austria in the Battle of Marengo, Napoleon gained control of northern Italy and forced the Austrians to sign a treaty recognizing French territorial gains there and in Belgium. For the next five years, an uneasy peace held sway. But Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of France, and many in Europe began to suspect that this Corsican upstart had limitless ambitions. Karl Mach, the Austrian quartermaster general, and an older and influential member of the Austrian military, advocated a preemptive strike against France, with an army large enough to guarantee victory. He told his colleagues, In war, the object is to beat the enemy, not merely to avoid being beaten. Mach and like-minded officers slowly gained influence, and in April 1805, Austria, England, and Russia signed a treaty of alliance to wage war on France and force her to return to her pre-Napoleonic borders. That summer, they formulated their plan. 95,000 Austrian troops would attack the French in northern Italy, redressing the humiliating defeat of 1800. Another 23,000 troops would secure the Tyrol between Italy and Austria. Mach would then lead a force of 70,000 men west along the Danube into Bavaria preventing this strategically located country from allying itself with France. Once encamped in Bavaria, Mach and his army would await the arrival a few weeks later of 75,000 troops from Russia. The two armies would link up, and this unstoppable force would march west into France. Meanwhile, the English would attack the French at sea. More troops would later be funneled into each war zone, making for an army totaling 500,000 men overall, the largest military force ever assembled in Europe up to that point. Not even Napoleon could withstand an army more than twice the size of his own, moving in on him from all sides. In the middle of September, Mach began his phase of the campaign by advancing along the Danube to Ulm in the heart of Bavaria. Having established his camp there, he felt hugely satisfied. Mach loathed disorder and uncertainty. He tried to think of everything in advance to come up with a clear plan and make sure everyone stuck to it. Clockwork warfare, he called it. He thought his plan was perfect. Nothing could go wrong. Napoleon was doomed. Mach had once been captured and forced to spend three years in France, where he had studied Napoleon's style of war. A key Napoleonic strategy was to make the enemy divide his forces, but now 
the trick was reversed. With trouble in Italy, Napoleon could not afford to send more than 70,000 French troops across the Rhine into Germany and Bavaria. The moment he crossed the Rhine, the Austrians would know his intentions and would act to slow his march. His army would need at least two months to reach Ulm and the Danube. By then, the Austrians would already have linked up with the Russians and swept through the Alsace and France. The strategy was as close to foolproof as any Mach had ever known. For Mach, the Russians could not arrive in Ulm too soon. Near the end of September, however, Mach began to sense something wrong. To the west of Ulm lay the Black Forest, between his own position and the French border. Suddenly, scouts were telling him that a French army was passing through the forest in his direction. Mach was bewildered. It made the best sense for Napoleon to cross the Rhine into Germany farther to the north, where his passage east would be smoother and harder to stop. But now he was yet again doing the unexpected, funneling an army through a narrow opening in the Black Forest and sending it straight at Mach. Even if this move were just a feint, Mach had to defend his position, so he sent part of his army west into the Black Forest to stem the French advance long enough for the Russians to come to his aid. A few days later, Mott began to feel horribly confused. The French were proceeding through the Black Forest, and some of their cavalry had come quite far. At the same time, though, word reached Mock of a large French army somewhere to the north of his position. The reports were contradictory. Some said this army was at Stuttgart, sixty miles northwest of Ulm, Others had it more to the east or even farther to the north, or quite close, near the Danube. Mach could get no hard information, since the French cavalry that had come through the Black Forest blocked access to the north for reconnaissance. The Austrian general now faced what he feared most, uncertainty, and it was clouding his ability to think straight. Finally, he ordered all of his troops back to Ulm, where he would concentrate his forces, Perhaps Napoleon intended to do battle at Ulm. At least Mach would have equal numbers. In early October, Austrian scouts were at last able to find out what was really going on, and it was a nightmare. A French army had crossed the Danube to the east of Ulm, blocking Mach's way back to Austria and cutting off the Russians. Another army lay to the south, blocking his route to Italy. How could 70,000 French soldiers appear in so many places at once, and move so fast? Gripped by panic, Mach sent probes in every direction. On October 11th, his men discovered a weak point. Only a small French force barred the way north and east. There, he could push through and escape the French encirclement. He began to prepare for the march. But two days later, when he was on the point of ordering the retreat, his scouts reported that a large French force had appeared overnight, blocking the northeastern route as well. On October 20th, finding out that the Russians had decided not to come to his rescue, Mach surrendered. Over 60,000 Austrian soldiers were taken prisoner with hardly a shot fired. It was one of the most splendidly bloodless victories in history. In the next few months, Napoleon's army turned east to deal with the Russians and remaining Austrians, culminating in his spectacular victory at Austerlitz. Meanwhile, Mach languished in an Austrian prison, sentenced to two years for his role in this humiliating defeat. There he racked his brains, losing his sanity in the process, some said. Where had this plan gone wrong? How had an army appeared out of nowhere to his east, so easily swallowing him up? He had never seen anything like it, and he was trying to figure it out to the end of his days. Interpretation History should not judge General Mach too harshly, for the French armies he faced in the fall of 1805 represented one of the greatest revolutions in military history. For thousands of years, war had been fought in essentially the same way. The commander led his large and unified army into battle, against an opponent of roughly equal size. He would never break up his army into smaller units, for that would violate the military principle of keeping one's forces concentrated. Furthermore, scattering his forces would make them harder to monitor, and he would lose control over the battle. 
Suddenly, Napoleon changed all that. In the years of peace between 1800 and 1805, he reorganized the French military, bringing different forces together to form the Grande Armée, 210,000 men strong. He divided this army into several corps, each with its own cavalry, infantry, artillery, and general staff. Each was led by a martial general, usually a young officer of proven strength in previous campaigns. Varying in size from 15,000 to 30,000 men, each corps was a miniature army headed by a miniature Napoleon. The key to the system was the speed with which the corps could move. Napoleon would give the marshals their missions, then let them accomplish it on their own. Little time was wasted with the passing of orders back and forth, and smaller armies needing less baggage could march with greater speed. Instead of a single army moving in a straight line, Napoleon could disperse and concentrate his corps in limitless patterns, which to the enemy seemed chaotic and unreadable. This was the monster that Napoleon unleashed on Europe in September 1805. Understand, the future belongs to groups that are fluid, fast, and nonlinear. Your natural tendency as a leader may be to want to control the group, to coordinate its every movement, but that will just tie you to the past and to the slow-moving armies of history. It takes strength of character to allow for a margin of chaos and uncertainty, to let go a little, but by decentralizing your army and segmenting it into teams, you will gain in mobility what you lose in complete control. And mobility is the greatest force multiplier of them all. It allows you to both disperse and concentrate your army, throwing it into patterns instead of advancing in straight lines. These patterns will confuse and paralyze your opponents. Give your different corps clear missions that fit your strategic goals, then let them accomplish them as they see fit. Smaller teams are faster, more creative, more adaptable. Their officers and soldiers are more engaged, more motivated. In the end, fluidity will bring you far more power and control than petty domination. Keys to Warfare The world is full of people looking for a secret formula for success and power. They do not want to think on their own, they just want a recipe to follow. They are attracted to the idea of strategy for that very reason. In their minds, strategy is a series of steps to be followed toward a goal. They want these steps spelled out for them by an expert or a guru. Believing in the power of imitation, they want to know exactly what some great person has done before. Their maneuvers in life are as mechanical as their thinking. To separate yourself from such a crowd, you need to get rid of a common misconception. The essence of strategy is not to carry out a brilliant plan that proceeds in steps. It is to put yourself in situations where you have more options than the enemy does. Instead of grasping at option A as the single right answer, true strategy is positioning yourself to be able to do A, B, or C, depending on the circumstances. That is strategic depth of thinking, as opposed to formulaic thinking. Sun Tzu expressed this idea differently. What you aim for in strategy, he said, is shi, a position of potential force. The position of a boulder perched precariously on a hilltop, say, or of a bowstring stretched taut. A tap on the boulder, the release of the bowstring, and potential force is violently unleashed. The boulder or arrow can go in any direction. It is geared to the actions of the enemy. What matters is not following preordained steps, but placing yourself in shi and giving yourself options. Napoleon had always aimed at his version of shi, and he perfected it in the 1805 campaign. Obsessed with structure and organization, he developed the core system, building flexibility into the very skeleton of his army. The lesson is simple. A rigid, centralized organization locks you into linear strategies. A fluid, segmented army gives you options, endless possibilities for reaching shi. Structure is strategy, perhaps the most important strategic choice you will make. Should you inherit a group, 
analyze its structure, and alter it to suit your purposes. Pour your creative energy into its organization, making fluidity your goal. Finally, you need to structure your group according to your soldiers' strengths and weaknesses, to their social circumstances. To do that, you must be attuned to the human side of your troops. You must understand them and the spirit of the times inside and out. During the American Civil War, the Union generals struggled with the ragtag nature of their army. Unlike the disciplined, well-trained troops of the Confederacy, many northern soldiers had been forcibly conscripted at the last minute. They were pioneers, rugged frontiersmen, and they were fiercely independent. Some generals tried desperately to instill discipline, and mostly they failed. Others just paid attention to map strategy while their armies continued to perform badly. General William Tecumseh Sherman had a different solution. He changed his organization to suit the personalities of his men. He created a more democratic army, encouraged initiative in his officers, let them dress as they saw fit. He loosened outward discipline to foster morale and group spirit. Like frontiersmen generally, his soldiers were restless and nomadic. So he exploited their mobility and kept his army in perpetual motion, always marching faster than his enemies could. Of all the Union armies, Sherman's were the most feared and performed the best. Like Sherman, do not struggle with your soldiers' idiosyncrasies, but rather turn them into a virtue, a way to increase your potential force. Be creative with the group's structure, keeping your mind as fluid and adaptable as the army you lead. Reversal even if you run a looser organization, there may be times when you will have to tighten it and give your officers less freedom. Wise generals set nothing in stone, always retaining the ability to reorganize their army to fit the times and their changing needs. 7. Transform your war into a crusade. Morale Strategies the secret to motivating people and maintaining their morale is to get them to think less about themselves and more about the group. Involve them in a cause, a crusade against a hated enemy. Make them see their survival as tied to the success of the army as a whole. In a group in which people have truly bonded, moods and emotions are so contagious that it becomes easy to infect your troops with enthusiasm. Lead from the front. Let your soldiers see you in the trenches, making sacrifices for the cause. That will fill them with the desire to emulate and please you. Make both rewards and punishments rare, but meaningful. Remember, a motivated army can work wonders, making up for any lack of material resources. The Art of Man Management Learn from history's great motivators and military leaders. The way to get soldiers to work together and maintain morale is to make them feel part of a group that is fighting for a worthy cause. That distracts them from their own interests and satisfies their human need to feel part of something bigger than they are. The more they think of the group, the less they think of themselves. They soon begin to link their own success to the groups. Their own interests and the larger interests coincide. In this kind of army, people know that selfish behavior will disgrace them in the eyes of their companions. They become attuned to a kind of group conscience. Morale is contagious. Put people in a cohesive, animated group, and they naturally catch that spirit. If they rebel or revert to selfish behavior, they are easily isolated. You must establish this dynamic the minute you become the group's leader. It can only come from the top. That is, from you. The ability to create the right group dynamic, to maintain the collective spirit, is known in military language as man management. History's great generals, Alexander the Great, Hannibal, Napoleon, were all masters of the art, which for military men is more than simply important. In battle, it can be the deciding issue, a matter of life and death. In war, Napoleon once said, the moral is to the physical as three to one. He meant that his troops' fighting spirit was crucial in the outcome of the battle. With motivated soldiers, he could beat an army three times the size of his own. 
To create the best group dynamic and prevent destructive morale problems, follow these eight crucial steps, culled from the writings and experiences of the masters of the art. It is important to follow as many of the steps as possible. None is less important than any other. Step 1. Unite your troops around a cause. Make them fight for an idea. Bring people together around a cause, and you create a motivated force. The cause can be anything you wish, but you should represent it as progressive. It fits the times. It is on the side of the future, so it is destined to succeed. If necessary, you can give it a veneer of spirituality. It is best to have some kind of enemy to hate. An enemy can help a group to define itself in opposition. Ignore this step, and you are left with an army of mercenaries. You will deserve the fate that usually awaits such armies. Step 2. Keep their bellies full. People cannot stay motivated if their material needs go unmet. If they feel exploited in any way, their natural selfishness will come to the surface and they will begin to peel off from the group. Attending to their physical needs will make it easier to ask more of them when the time comes. Step 3. Lead from the front. The enthusiasm with which people join a cause inevitably wanes. One thing that speeds up its loss and that produces discontent is the feeling that the leaders do not practice what they preach. Right from the beginning, your troops must see you leading from the front, sharing their dangers and sacrifices, taking the cause as seriously as they do. Instead of trying to push them from behind, make them run to keep up with you. Step 4. Concentrate their qi. There is a Chinese belief in an energy called qi, which dwells in all living things. All groups have their own level of qi, physical and psychological. A leader must understand this energy and know how to manipulate it. Idleness has a terrible effect on qi. When soldiers are not working, their spirits lower, doubts creep in, and selfish interests take over. Similarly, being on the defensive, always waiting and reacting to what the enemy dishes out, will also lower qi. So keep your soldiers busy, acting for a purpose, moving in a direction. Propelling them forward will excite them and make them hungry for battle. Aggressive action concentrates qi, and concentrated qi is full of latent force. Step 5. Play to their emotions. The best way to motivate people is not through reason, but through emotion. Humans, however, are naturally defensive, and if you begin with an appeal to their emotions, some histrionic harangue, they will see you as manipulative and will recoil. An emotional appeal needs a setup. Lower their defenses and make them bond as a group by putting on a show, entertaining them, telling a story. Now they have less control over their emotions, and you can approach them more directly moving them easily from laughter to anger or hatred. Masters of man management have a sense of drama. They know when and how to hit their soldiers in the gut. Step 6. Mix Harshness and Kindness The key to man management is a balance of punishment and reward. Too many rewards will spoil your soldiers and make them take you for granted. Too much punishment will destroy their morale. You need to hit the right balance. Make your kindness rare, and even an occasional warm comment or generous act will be powerfully meaningful. Anger and punishment should be equally rare. Instead, your harshness should take the form of setting very high standards that few can reach. Make your soldiers compete to please you. Make them struggle to see less harshness and more kindness. Step 7 build the group myth. The armies with the highest morale are armies that have been tested in battle. Soldiers who have fought alongside one another through many campaigns forge a kind of group myth based on their past victories. Living up to the tradition and reputation of the group becomes a matter of pride. Anyone who lets it down feels ashamed. To generate this myth, you must lead your troops into as many campaigns as you can. Success alone will help bring the group together. 
Create symbols and slogans that fit the myth. Your soldiers will want to belong. Step 8. Be ruthless with grumblers. Allow grumblers and the chronically disaffected any leeway at all, and they will spread disquiet and even panic throughout the group. As fast as you can, you must isolate them and get rid of them. Historical Example In the early 1630s, Oliver Cromwell, 1599-1658, a provincial gentleman farmer in Cambridgeshire, England, fell victim to a depression and to constant thoughts of death. Deep in crisis, he converted to the Puritan religion, and suddenly his life took a new turn. He felt he had experienced a direct communion with God. Now he believed in providence, the idea that everything happens for a reason and according to God's will. Whereas before he had been despondent and indecisive, now he was filled with purpose. He thought himself among God's elect. Eventually, Cromwell became a member of Parliament and a vocal defender of the common people in their grievances against the aristocracy. Yet he felt marked by providence for something larger than politics. He had visions of a great crusade. In 1642, Parliament, in a bitter struggle with Charles I, voted to cut off the king's funds until he agreed to limits on royal power. When Charles refused, civil war broke out between the Cavaliers, supporters of the king who wore their hair long, and the Roundheads, the rebels so-called since they cropped their hair short. Parliament's most fervent supporters were Puritans like Cromwell, who saw the war against the king as his chance, more than his chance, his calling. Although Cromwell had no military background, he hurriedly formed a troop of sixty horsemen from his native Cambridgeshire. His aim was to incorporate them in a larger regiment, gain military experience by fighting under another commander, and slowly prove his worth. He was confident of ultimate victory, for he saw his side as unbeatable. After all, God was on their side, and all his men were believers in the cause of creating a more pious England. Despite his lack of experience, Cromwell was something of a military visionary. He imagined a new kind of warfare spearheaded by a faster, more mobile cavalry, and in the war's first few months he proved a brave and effective leader. He was given more troops to command, but soon realized that he had grossly overestimated the fighting spirit of those on his side. Time and again he led cavalry charges that pierced enemy lines, only to watch in disgust as his soldiers broke order to plunder the enemy camp. Sometimes he tried to hold part of his force in reserve to act as reinforcements later in the battle, but the only command they listened to was to advance, and in retreat they were hopelessly disordered. Representing themselves as crusaders, Cromwell's men were revealed by battle as mercenaries, fighting for pay and adventure. They were useless. In 1643, when Cromwell was made a colonel at the head of his own regiment, he decided to break with the past. From now on, he would recruit only soldiers of a certain kind, men who, like himself, had experienced religious visions and revelations. He sounded out the aspirants, tested them for the depth of their faith, Departing from a long tradition, he appointed commoners, not aristocrats, as officers. Cromwell made his recruits sing psalms and pray together. In a stern check on bad discipline, he taught them to see all their actions as part of God's plan. And he looked after them in an unusual way for the times, making sure they were well fed, well clothed, and promptly paid. When Cromwell's army went into battle, it was now a force to reckon with. The men rode in tight formation, loudly singing psalms. As they neared the king's forces, they would break into a pretty round trot, not the headlong and disorderly charge of other troops. Even in contact with the enemy, they kept their order, and they retreated with as much discipline as when they advanced. Since they believed that God was with them, they had no fear of death. They could march straight up a hill into enemy fire without breaking step. Having gained control over his cavalry, Cromwell could maneuver them with infinite flexibility. 
his troops won battle after battle. In 1645, Cromwell was named Lieutenant General of the Cavalry in a new model army. That year, at the Battle of Naseby, his disciplined regiment was crucial in the Roundhead's victory. A few days later, his cavalry finished off the Royalist forces at Langport, effectively putting an end to the first stage of the Civil War. Interpretation That Cromwell is generally considered one of history's great military leaders is all the more remarkable given that he learned soldiery on the job. During the second stage of the Civil War, he became head of the Roundhead armies, and later, after defeating King Charles and having him executed, he became Lord Protector of England. Although he was ahead of his times with his visions of mobile warfare, Cromwell was not a brilliant strategist or field tactician. His success lay in the morale and discipline of his cavalry, and the secret to those was the quality of the men he recruited, true believers in his cause. Such men were naturally open to his influence and accepting of his discipline. With each new victory, they grew more committed to him and more cohesive. He could ask the most of them. Above all else, then, pay attention to your staff, to those you recruit to your cause. Many will pretend to share your beliefs, but your first battle will show that all they wanted was a job. Soldiers like these are mercenaries and will get you nowhere. True believers are what you want. Expertise and impressive resumes matter less than character and the capacity for sacrifice. Recruits of character will give you a staff already open to your influence, making morale and discipline infinitely easier to attain. This core personnel will spread the gospel for you, keeping the rest of the army in line. As far as possible in this secular world, make battle a religious experience, an ecstatic involvement in something transcending the present. Reversal If morale is contagious, so is its opposite. Fear and discontent can spread through your troops like wildfire. The only way to deal with them is to cut them off before they turn into panic and rebellion. Waste no time and deal with the whole group. Appeal to their pride and dignity. Make them feel ashamed of their moment of weakness and madness. Remind them of what they have accomplished in the past and show them how they are falling short of the ideal. This social shaming will wake them up and reverse the dynamic. Part 3. Defensive Warfare to fight in a defensive manner is not a sign of weakness. It is the height of strategic wisdom, a powerful style of waging war. Its requirements are simple. First, you must make the most of your resources, fighting with perfect economy and engaging only in battles that are necessary. Second, you must know how and when to retreat, luring an aggressive enemy into an imprudent attack. Then, waiting patiently for his moment of exhaustion, launch a vicious counterattack. In a world that frowns on displays of overt aggression, the ability to fight defensively, to let others make the first move and then wait for their own mistakes to destroy them, will bring you untold power. Because you waste neither energy nor time, you are always ready for the next inevitable battle. Your career will be long and fruitful. To fight this way, you must master the arts of deception. By seeming weaker than you are, you can draw the enemy into an ill-advised attack. By seeming stronger than you are, perhaps through an occasional act that is reckless and bold, you can deter the enemy from attacking you. In defensive warfare, you are essentially leveraging your weaknesses and limitations into power and victory. The following four sections will instruct you in the basic arts of defensive warfare, economy of means, counterattack, intimidation, and deterrence, and how to retreat skillfully and lie low when under aggressive attack. 8. Pick your battles carefully. The perfect economy strategy. We all have limitations. Our energies and skills will take us only so far. Danger comes from trying to surpass our limits. 
Seduced by some glittering prize into overextending ourselves, we end up exhausted and vulnerable. You must know your limits and pick your battles carefully. Consider the hidden costs of a war. Time lost, political goodwill squandered, an embittered enemy bent on revenge. Sometimes it is better to wait, to undermine your enemies covertly, rather than hitting them straight on. If battle cannot be avoided, get them to fight on your terms. Aim at their weaknesses, make the war expensive for them and cheap for you. Fighting with perfect economy, you can outlast even the most powerful foe. The Spiral Effect in 281 BC, war broke out between Rome and the city of Tarentum, on Italy's east coast. Tarentum had begun as a colony of the Greek city of Sparta. Its citizens still spoke Greek, considered themselves cultured Spartans, and thought other Italian cities barbaric. Rome, meanwhile, was an emerging power, locked in a series of wars with neighboring cities. The prudent Romans were reluctant to take on Tarentum. It was Italy's wealthiest city at the time, rich enough to finance its allies in a war against Rome. It was also too far away, off in the southeast, to pose an immediate threat. But the Tarentines had sunk some Roman ships that had wandered into their harbor, killing the fleet's admiral. And when Rome had tried to negotiate a settlement, its ambassadors had been insulted. Roman honor was at stake, and it readied itself for war. Tarentum had a problem. It was wealthy, but had no real army. Its citizens had gotten used to easy living. The solution was to call in a Greek army to fight on its behalf. The Spartans were otherwise occupied, so the Tarentines called on King Pyrrhus of Epirus, the greatest Greek warrior king since Alexander the Great. Epirus was a small kingdom in west-central Greece. It was a poor land, sparsely populated, with meager resources, but Pyrrhus, raised on stories of Achilles, for whom his family claimed to be descended, and of Alexander the Great, a distant cousin, was determined to follow in the footsteps of his illustrious ancestors and relatives, expanding Epirus and carving out his own empire. In battle, he had become known for leading dangerous charges, earning himself the nickname The Eagle. Back in Epirus, he had built up his small army and trained it well, even managing to defeat the much larger Macedonian army in several battles. The Tarentines' offer was tempting. First, they promised him money and a large army raised from allied states. Second, by defeating the Romans, he could make himself master of Italy, and from Italy he could take first Sicily, then Carthage in North Africa. Alexander had moved east to create his empire. Pyrrhus could move west and dominate the Mediterranean. He accepted the offer. In the spring of 280 BC, Pyrrhus set sail with the largest Greek army ever to cross into Italy. 20,000 foot soldiers, 3,000 horsemen, 2,000 bowmen, and 20 elephants. Once in Tarentum, though, he realized he had been tricked. Not only did the Tarentines have no army, they had made no effort to assemble one, leaving Pyrrhus to do it himself. Pyrrhus wasted no time. He declared a military dictatorship in the city, and began to build and train an army from among the Tarentines as fast as possible. Pyrrhus's arrival in Tarentum worried the Romans, who knew his reputation as a strategist and fighter, deciding to give him no time to prepare. They quickly sent out an army, forcing Pyrrhus to make do with what he had, and he set off to face them. The two armies met near the town of Heraclea. Pyrrhus and his troops were outnumbered, and at one point were on the verge of defeat, when he unleashed his secret weapon, his elephants, with their massive weight, loud, fearsome trumpeting, and soldiers on top firing arrows down at will. The Romans had never faced elephants in battle before and panic spread among them, turning the tide of the fight. Soon the disciplined Roman legions were in headlong retreat. The eagle had won a great victory. His fame spread across the Italian peninsula. He was, indeed, the reincarnation of Alexander the Great. Now other cities sent him reinforcements, more than making up for his losses at Heraclea. But Pyrrhus was worried. 
He had lost many veterans in the battle, including key generals. More important, the strength and discipline of the Roman legions had impressed him. They were like no other troops he had faced. He decided to try to negotiate a peaceful settlement with the Romans, offering to share the peninsula with them. At the same time, though, he marched on Rome to give the negotiations urgency and to make it clear that unless the Romans sued for peace, they would face him again. The Romans proudly rejected the offer of a settlement. They would never share Italy. The two armies met again near the town of Asculum, not far from Rome, in the spring of 279 B.C. This time, their numbers were about equal. The first day of battle was fierce, and once again the Romans seemed to have the edge. But on the second day, Pyrrhus, a strategic master, managed to lure the Roman legions onto terrain better suited to his own style of maneuvering, and he gained the advantage. As was his wont near the end of the day, he personally led a violent charge at the heart of the Roman legions, elephants in front, the Romans scattered, and Pyrrhus was once again victorious. King Pyrrhus had now scaled the heights, yet he felt only gloom and foreboding. His losses had been terrible, the ranks of the generals he depended on were decimated, and he himself had been badly wounded. At the same time, the Romans seemed inexhaustible, undaunted by their defeat. When congratulated on his victory at Asculum, he replied, If we defeat the Romans in one more such battle, we shall be totally ruined. Pyrrhus, however, was already ruined. His losses at Asculum were too large to be quickly replaced, and his remaining forces were too few to fight the Romans again. His Italian campaign was over. Interpretation From the story of King Pyrrhus and his famous lament after the Battle of Asculum comes the expression Pyrrhic victory, signifying a triumph that is as good as a defeat, for it comes at too great a cost. The victor is too exhausted to exploit his win, too vulnerable to face the next battle. And indeed, after the victory, Pyrrhus staggered from one disaster to the next, his army never quite strong enough to defeat his growing hosts of enemies. This culminated in his untimely death in battle, ending Epirus's hopes to become a power in Greece. Pyrrhic victories are much more common than you might think. Excitement about a venture's prospects is natural before it begins, and if the goal is enticing, we unconsciously see what we want to see, more of the possible gains, fewer of the possible difficulties. The further we go, the harder it becomes to pull back and rationally reassess the situation. In such circumstances, the costs tend not just to mount, they spiral out of control. If things go badly, we get exhausted, which leads us to make mistakes, which lead to new unforeseen problems, which in turn lead to new costs. Any victories we might have along the way are meaningless. Understand, the more you want the prize, the more you must compensate by examining what getting it will take. Look beyond the obvious costs and think about the intangible ones, the goodwill you may squander by waging war the fury of the loser if you win, the time that winning may take, your debt to your allies. You can always wait for a better time. You can always try something more in line with your resources. Remember, history is littered with the corpses of people who ignored the costs. Save yourself on necessary battles and live to fight another day. Keys to Warfare War is a balance of ends and means. A general might have the best plan to achieve a certain end, but unless he has the means to accomplish it, his plan is worthless. Wise generals through the ages, then, have learned to begin by examining the means they have at hand, and then to develop their strategy out of those tools. That is what made Hannibal a brilliant strategist. He would always think first of the givens, the makeup of his own army, and of the enemies their respective proportions of cavalry and infantry, the terrain, his troops' morale, the weather. That would give him the foundation, not only for his plan of attack, but for the ends he wanted to achieve in this particular encounter. Instead of being locked into a way of fighting, like so many generals, 
he constantly adjusted his ends to his means. That was the strategic advantage he used again and again. The next time you launch a campaign, try an experiment. Do not think about either your solid goals or your wishful dreams, and do not plan out your strategy on paper. Instead, think deeply about what you have, the tools and materials you will be working with. Ground yourself not in dreams and plans, but in reality. Think of your own skills, any political advantage you might have, the morale of your troops, how creatively you can use the means at your disposal. Then, out of that process, let your plans and goals blossom. Not only will your strategies be more realistic, they will be more inventive and forceful. Dreaming first of what you want, and then trying to find the means to reach it, is a recipe for exhaustion, waste, and defeat. Do not mistake cheapness for perfect economy. Armies have failed by spending too little as often as by spending too much. Perfect economy does not mean hoarding your resources. That is not economy, but stinginess, deadly in war. Perfect economy means finding a golden mean, a level at which your blows count, but do not wear you out. Over-economizing will wear you out more, for the war will drag on its costs growing, without your ever being able to deliver a knockout punch. Fighting economically will build momentum. Think of it as finding your level, a perfect balance between what you are capable of and the task at hand. When the job you are doing is neither above nor below your talents, but at your level, you are neither exhausted nor bored and depressed. You suddenly have new energy and creativity. Fighting with perfect economy is like hitting that level. Less resistance in your path, greater energy unleashed. Oddly enough, knowing your limits will expand your limits. Getting the most out of what you have will let you have more. Reversal There can never be any value in fighting uneconomically, but it is always a wise course to make your opponent waste as much of his resources as possible. This can be done through hit-and-run tactics, forcing him to expend energy chasing after you, lure him into thinking that one big offensive will ruin you, then bog that offensive down in a protracted war in which he loses valuable time and resources. A frustrated opponent, exhausting energy on punches he cannot land, will soon make mistakes and open himself up to a vicious counterattack. 9. Turn the Tables The Counterattack Strategy Moving first, initiating the attack, will often put you at a disadvantage. You are exposing your strategy and limiting your options. Instead, discover the power of holding back and letting the other side move first, giving you the flexibility to counterattack from any angle. If your opponents are aggressive, bait them into a rash attack that will leave them in a weak position. Learn to use their impatience, their eagerness to get at you, as a way to throw them off balance and bring them down. In difficult moments, do not despair or retreat. Any situation can be turned around. If you learn how to hold back, waiting for the right moment to launch an unexpected counterattack, weakness can become strength. Jiu-Jitsu in 1920, the Democratic Party nominated Ohio Governor James Cox as its candidate to succeed the retiring President Woodrow Wilson. At the same time, it named 38-year-old Franklin Delano Roosevelt as its vice presidential nominee. Roosevelt had served as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Wilson. More important, he was the cousin of Theodore Roosevelt, still very popular after his presidency in the first decade of the century. The Republican nominee was Warren G. Harding, and the campaign was a grueling affair. The Republicans had a lot of money. They avoided talking about the issues and played up Harding's folksy image. Cox and Roosevelt responded to the Republicans by going on a vigorous offensive, basing their campaign on a single issue of Wilson's, American participation in the League of Nations, which they hoped would bring peace and prosperity. Roosevelt campaigned all over the country, delivering speech after speech. 
The idea was to counter the Republicans' money with sheer effort. But the race was a disaster. Harding won the presidency in one of the biggest landslides in American electoral history. The following year, Roosevelt was stricken with polio and lost the use of his legs. Coming just after the disastrous 1920 campaign, his illness marked a turning point in his life. Suddenly made aware of his physical fragility and mortality, he retreated into himself and reassessed. The world of politics was vicious and violent. To win an election, people would do anything, stooping to all kinds of personal attacks. The public official moving in this world was under pressure to be as unscrupulous as everyone else and survive as best he could. But that approach did not suit Roosevelt personally and took too much out of him physically. He decided to craft a different political style, one that would separate him from the crowd and give him a constant advantage. In 1932, after a stint as governor of New York, Roosevelt ran as the Democratic presidential nominee against the Republican incumbent, Herbert Hoover. The country was in the midst of the Depression, and Hoover seemed incapable of dealing with it. Given the weakness of his record, a defensive hand was a difficult one for him to play, and, like the Democrats in 1920, he went vigorously on the offensive, attacking Roosevelt as a socialist. Roosevelt, in turn, traveled the country speaking on his ideas for getting America out of the Depression. He didn't give many specifics, nor did he respond to Hoover's attacks directly, but he radiated confidence and ability. Hoover, meanwhile, seemed shrill and aggressive. The Depression would probably have doomed him to defeat whatever he did, but he lost far bigger than expected. The size of Roosevelt's victory, nearly an electoral sweep, surprised one and all. In the weeks following the election, Roosevelt essentially hid from public view. Slowly, his enemies on the right began to use his absence to attack him, circulating speculation that he was unprepared for the challenge of the job. The criticisms became pointed and aggressive. At his inauguration, however, Roosevelt gave a rousing speech, and in his first months in office, now known as the Hundred Days, he switched from the appearance of inactivity to a powerful offensive hurrying through legislation that made the country feel as if something were finally being done. The sniping died. Over the next few years, this pattern repeatedly recurred. Roosevelt would face resistance. The Supreme Court, say, would overturn his programs, and enemies on all sides, Senator Huey Long and Labor leader John L. Lewis on the left, Father Charles Coughlin and wealthy businessmen on the right would launch hostile campaigns in the press. Roosevelt would retreat, ceding the spotlight. In his absence, the attacks would seem to pick up steam, and his advisors would panic. But Roosevelt was just biding his time. Eventually, he knew, people would tire of these endless attacks and accusations, particularly because, by refusing to reply to them, he made them inevitably one-sided. Then usually a month or two before election time, he would go on the offensive, defending his record and attacking his opponents suddenly and vigorously enough to catch them all off guard. The timing would also jolt the public, winning him their attention. In the periods when Roosevelt was silent, his opponents' attacks would grow, and grow more shrill, but that only gave him material he could use later, taking advantage of their hysteria to make them ridiculous. The most famous example of this came in 1944, when that year's Republican presidential nominee, Thomas Dewey, launched a series of personal attacks on Roosevelt, questioning the activities of his wife, his sons, and even his dog, the Scotch Terrier Falla, who Dewey accused of being pampered at the taxpayer's expense. Roosevelt countered in a campaign speech. The Republican leaders have not been content to make personal attacks upon me, or my sons. They now include my little dog, Thala. Unlike the members of my family, Thala resents this. When he learned that the Republican fiction writers had concocted a story that I left him behind on an Aleutian island and had sent a destroyer back to find him, at a cost to the taxpayer of two or three or eight or twenty million dollars, his Scotch soul was furious. 
He has not been the same dog since. I am accustomed to hearing malicious falsehoods about myself, but I think I have the right to object to libelous statements about my dog. Devastatingly funny, the speech was also ruthlessly effective. And how could his opponents reply to it when it quoted their own words right back at them? Year after year, Roosevelt's opponents exhausted themselves attacking him, scoring points at moments when it didn't matter, and losing one landslide election after another to him. Interpretation Roosevelt's style can be likened to jujitsu, the Japanese art of self-defense. In jiu-jitsu, a fighter baits opponents by staying calm and patient, getting them to make the first aggressive move. As they come at the fighter and either strike at him or grab hold of him, either push or pull, the fighter moves with them, using their strength against them. As he deftly steps forward or back at the right moment, the force of their own momentum throws them off balance. Often they actually fall, and even if they don't, they leave themselves vulnerable to a counter-blow. Their aggression becomes their weakness, for it commits them to an obvious attack, exposing their strategy and making it hard for them to stop. In politics, jiu-jitsu style yields endless benefits. It gives you the ability to fight without seeming aggressive. It saves energy for your opponent's tire while you stay above the fray and it widens your options, allowing you to build on what they give you. Keys to Warfare Thousands of years ago, at the dawn of military history, various strategists in different cultures noticed a peculiar phenomenon. In battle, the side that was on the defensive often won in the end. There seemed to be several reasons for this. First, once the aggressor went on the attack, he had no more surprises in store. The defender could clearly see his strategy and take protective action. Second, if the defender could somehow turn back this initial attack, the aggressor would be left in a weak position. His army was disorganized and exhausted. It requires more energy to take land than to hold it. If the defenders could take advantage of this weakness to deliver a counterblow, they could often force the aggressor to retreat. Based on these observations, the art of the counterattack was developed. Its basic tenets were to let the enemy make the first move, actively baiting him into an aggressive attack 